in, in, in a minute. Um, but uh, a quick word to say thank you very much for the effort and the time. We recognise it's a great investment and hopefully we'll, we'll pay uh, in terms of the quality of content that we hope to deliver to you today. Um, we need to move things on, so I, don't, I won't go on for too long. What I'll do now is pass the microphone on to the chairman of the chamber, uh, Mr. Chicho Kehigwe, who will uh, say a few words of welcome. Thank you. Welcome to this round table conference uh, organized by the Nigerian Norwegian Chamber of Commerce. Our organization is just about a year old. This is the first of many uh, such engagement we intend to have with the business community. And we are honored and, and pleased to have you all here today. And uh, like uh, Abiji said, uh, we'll try and be sure that the quality of the content of this day we have had to ask you to spend with us will be just worth your while. I will go ahead and hand over the mic to the Norwegian Ambassador. story. Uh, those of you who know me know that I'm better at a conspiracy corner for a certain purpose than uh, holding a speech, but I'll say a few words uh, in addition. We um, believe and uh, the Norwegian government is very well aware now, and it hasn't always been like that, that Nigeria is, well, everyone knows, the biggest population on the continent, that's the biggest <coughs> same time, there are certain perceptions about Nigeria which prevents business from coming here. And I think everyone has to be quite honest about that. And uh, to, to fight those perceptions, I have put that as one of my uh, most important uh, tasks coming here. And uh, because I mean, there's a certain percentage of crooks in every country. That means there's a not lot of crooks in Nigeria, more than in Norway, because you have such a big population. But if the percentage is the same, I mean, and, and no one comes to make business with crooks, I mean, that says something about yourself also. So if you come, you, you find so many people here who, where you can make real good business. And this is uh, business for, for, for common uh, advantages and common benefits. Um, but one thing, uh, I think, I mean, it's the, um, Nigeria is so much, and uh, for me, I, and I'm not, uh, I never be a businessman, I will never be a businessman, but I, uh, I mean, without business, no country, no, no future. Uh, but it, it can be supported by so many other things, and, and when it comes to perception about Nigeria, it's uh, probably one of the countries with the best, uh, best novelists in the world. Uh, only in Oslo, uh, no, the Nigerian novels are published uh, and translated to Norwegians throughout the year. And, and, and there are so many. Uh, one had uh, the, the maiden uh, presentation in Oslo recently. Uh, and I said uh, Nigeria is uh, the biggest economy, the biggest market, the biggest population, but how 
Norway also the most in innovative uh, in, in the continent. And this block has innovation, which uh, is lead to and should lead to more business between uh, Nigeria and Norway. And, and I know I'm also the representative from the EU, from, uh, from other European countries here, to between Nigeria and, and, and Europe to, to deliver to that. Uh, there is sectors we should try to focus. I think that's our objective and uh, there are now representatives here today from Innovation Norway and from NORA, the Innovation Development Agency. Uh, we should focus on, on trying to look into and nurture those areas where there are competitive advantages for Nigeria and Norwegian cooperation. So um, I just want to wish you the best of luck for started uh, now. I just want to give a, a brief conceptual over overview of why we chose the topics that we, we did for this uh, roundtable. The most significant strategic opportunity that we have as a country, Nigeria, is export. Uh, and there are a number of reasons why that is the case. One of the reasons is because there is such a significant asymmetric advantage in, in tariff regimes between developing countries and developed countries. And I'm not sure that we all, one, know what these advantages are, and two, know how to exploit them. For that, we have a great speaker uh, from uh, the EU, the EU Trade Councillor, who I'll uh, introduce in a minute, who will talk us through what those advantages are. The other point is really the focus that we have in Nigeria to diversify our economy from oil to other sectors of which export is a significant amount of uh, a, a significant amount of potential revenue. For that, hopefully, we will have uh, Ulushe Gumawolowa, who is, I think, running a little late, to talk to us about the commitment uh, and the programs that the government are looking to ex exploit in order to, to generate uh, much of our export trade going forward. We have an excellent company, FoodPro, who is in the export business, who will talk to us as a case study about his business, the challenges he faces and the opportunities he sees. And we have a significant gentleman from the Bank of Industry to talk about the support the government gives to financing export-oriented businesses. That's the export part of the day for power in Nigeria. And then we focus specifically on the area of renewables, we have the pleasure of uh, the Assistant Director of Renewables from the Ministry of Power talking to us about this. Then we look at a very specific opportunity in the renewable space. We're very fortunate to have uh, a, a great speaker uh, talk to us about the Nigeria Energy Support Program. I shan't steal his thunder, so I'll wait, I'll, uh, I'll wait for him to speak to that. We have a case study of a world-class company, Scatic Solar. Uh, we have a representative who is going to talk about securing a deal in Nigeria in the uh, the solar energy space, which is very interesting. And fortunately, we have uh, a, a quite a senior figure from Union Bank talking to us about financing deals uh, within the uh, renewable energy space. To top it all off, we have uh, a great partnership opportunity with a world-class organization in, in uh, Norway, uh, Innovation Norway, who will introduce who they are and what they do and how, hopefully, they will look to support the development of multi-sector industries in, in Nigeria looking forward. There is a regional footprint. It's hoping to grow in Nigeria. So that's the structure of the day. And we're hoping through all of that, if you walk away with a really good sense of, of the opportunities in export and a good feel for the commercial opportunity in the specific
specific area of, of renewables in power, we will, we will develop some really good value to your day. So that's the structure of the day. Any questions for me before I hand over to the first speaker? No. Just a, 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 a question of housekeeping. Could I ask that you please turn your phones off, or at the very least, have your phones on silent? So, as a mark of respect, of course, to, to our distinguished speakers and guests as well. Throughout the day, if you have any questions at all for me, do grab me. Uh, or the chair. Uh, my name is Hippo Mato. I am the head of the trade and economy section of the European Union delegation from Nigeria and DECOVAS. And I want to thank uh, the Nigerian Norwegian Chamber of Commerce. I'm very honored to be here at the first uh, round table. The business time to understand this is the first one. So I'm very honored and uh, I want to congratulate Edward because he has persuaded me to come here and understand the closure of the Abuja airport. <laughs> so I had my first experience through the Kaduna airport to come here, which was actually quite good. Uh, the, 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 all, the airplane, all the airlines were on time. Uh, and, uh, so it seems that this move in the end is a successful one. So um, when Edward asked me to present the EPA, one of the first things I wanted to check economic partnership agreement between West Africa and the European Union, it was, well, well, would this agreement apply to Norway? Because, of course, Norway is part of the, uh, you know, it, 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 the so-called European Economic Area, uh, which is composed of the European Union, all the 28, or well, it's the 28, uh, member states, plus Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein. Um, and, but this is actually a free trade area. So goods can circulate freely, goods originating from all these countries, from these 31 countries, can circulate freely. But um, there is no common trade policy of the EEA. So that means that when it comes to negotiating trade agreements, the EU has, uh, has uh, its own uh, competence, and uh, the EEA countries, the other EEA countries, so Norway, uh, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, I suppose probably within EFTA, within yeah. EFTA, Within EFTA, you negotiate, you negotiate with, F, with, with Switzerland, you negotiate your own trade agreements as a block. So that means that when, uh, hopefully, the EPA will enter into force, it will not uh, allow, um, uh, of course, the same benefits that it allows the European Union, but, of course, if it can create a good example, that can be followed also by our partners in the future. So uh, let me start with an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So, well, first of all, a brief description and introduction of what the EPA is about. And we'll try to describe the benefits uh, uh, of, the, of the economic partnership agreement for the uh, Nigerian industry. We're taking some example case studies uh, in the textile and agribusiness industry. Uh, then, of course, a question I always get. I mean, why are you talking about the benefits for Nigeria? <laughs> for West Africa, you don't talk about the benefits for the European Union. So that is, of course, something I, I, I will deal with as well. And what are the concerns which are actually delaying the signature of the EPA uh, by the three remaining countries of West Africa? And then uh, a few words on the way forward. So, by did actually didn't boost trade relations between the between the EU and the ACP. But uh, above all, uh, in particular, the problem was that uh, this system was clearly not compatible with WTO rules. Uh, we actually, uh, the European Union, lost a case uh, at the WTO. Uh, it's a, the famous banana case where we, we were clearly told you cannot give preferential access. Uh, to ACP countries and discriminate for the other developing or least developed countries in the world, they don't have the same access. Uh, so you are dis this discrimination is not compatible. If you want to give a, a, a preferential access, then you have to enter into a, a real agreement where there is some reciprocity. And so where also the other party, the ACP countries, would also give something in exchange. That would be compatible with WTO rules. So we started to discuss with our ACP partners and we came to the conclusion that this that the negotiating EPAs, so reciprocal, though I will explain very asymmetrical agreements, because they are very unbalanced in favor of the ACP countries, uh, was, was the way forward. EPAs also had the advantage, I will explain why, to foster regional economic integration. The decision was to negotiate these economic partnership agreements, not with individual ACP countries, but with regional blocs. So the idea was we had, we had uh, this, this has brought a lot of economic prosperity, but a lot of stability. And uh, uh, you know, we were coming out from the war. We we're celebrating in a few days the 60th anniversary of the European communities. 
And you know, it's amazing in 60 years how much peace and stability uh, this agreement, which was originally economic, but you know, it, 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 uh, prosperity and, uh, and economic stability can bring also peace and, and, uh, and political stability. So the idea was to negotiate this agreement with regional blocs to foster other regional economic communities to create and to, uh, to, to get similar, similar uh, successful um, stories like the European Union. And West Africa, you know, you are part of a, a REC, of a REC, a regional economic community, which is the ECOWAS member states, 15 member states. Um, and there are those who have negotiated the agreement with, with, with the European Union. Then there are similar economic partnership agreements with a number of other regions. And then, of course, the EPA has the advantage to encourage reforms in economic governance. As I said, when you have an international agreement, you have stable, long-term, predictable uh, rules which normally you don't have if you just grant unilateral access and you don't really have real rules. Eh? So to give an example, um, AGOA, which I always hear as something compared to, to the EPA, AGOA is actually unilateral access and, uh, and um, favorable treatment that the United States is giving to certain countries, in particular African countries, but it's unilateral, it's not a real international So as I said, there are a number of EPAs uh, negotiated with, uh, with uh, many ACP countries. I'll just give you an overview. There is, uh, I think the first one that uh, was negotiated, entered into force, it's already been implemented for many years, is with the CARIFORUM, with Caribbeans. Uh, there are already a few years of implementation, but we're talking about Africa, there, there are already a number of EPAs which are uh, been signed, Ratify as someone has not been able to negotiate as a regional block yet, but Cameroon has already an EPA, a provisional uh, bilateral EPA with the uh, region. Have an EPA applying already since, uh, uh, actually, is January 2013, but provisionally was already applying since May 2012. Um, then we have uh, uh, an agreement, an EPA signed by Kenya, Rwanda, which should uh, also be signed by a number of other countries of the, uh, the, the East African community. Uh, but um, um, there, Tanzania is raising concerns similar, when I see them, similar to the one I, I, I hear sometimes here in Nigeria, uh, and that is delaying the entry to force of that agreement. Who has already signed an agreement which is already entered into force and is applicable since, 2006, since October 2016 is uh, uh, South African Development Community, some of the uh, South African Development Community countries in particular South Africa, Botswana, Lesotho, Mozambique, Namibia, and Swaziland. So this is an EPA already in force of a regional bloc since 2016. Uh, West Africa, what is the situation in West Africa? Well, negotiation were concluded in uh, 2014. Actually, all countries, all European countries, uh, and all the vast majority of the West African countries have signed this EPA. But the only remaining signature, the outstanding ones are from uh, Ghana, sorry, uh, no, are from uh, um, the Gambia, Mauritania, and Nigeria. Now let me say, Mauritania has a special status. It used to be part of ECOWAS. It, it went out of ECOWAS, but it saw the benefits and the opportunities of this agreement, so it decided that it wanted to be part of it. So uh, just for the purpose of the application of this agreement, Mauritania has been part of it, and has to sign it as well. But now there is a technical delay in order to be able to benefit from an agreement which has been negotiated by the ECOWAS Commission on behalf of West Africa. Recent change of government, uh, an important and welcome change, uh, and, and uh, we believe that this might, uh, might we hope that might uh, actually uh, lead to a, a signature of uh, the Gambia of the EPA as well. So Nigeria is, is actually the country which is not, I will, I will try to explain why, and why if the, there are no concerns and it seems that it should be actually uh, be given by Nigeria as well. What are the EPA, EPA cornerstones? Well, as I mentioned, it's a bilateral, long-term preferential agreement, so it's just not an unilateral, uh, you know, uh, privileged, uh, favorable access which is given to ACP countries. It is reciprocal, of course, reciprocity is part of an agreement. You, you're doing something, you're receiving something, in return. that's reciprocity. But the important thing, you shouldn't just talk about reciprocity. Sometimes I hear concern just about the word reciprocity. Of course, if you have an agreement, you have reciprocity. You're, you're, you, there, are, there are obligations and there are, and there are rights for both parties. So that's reciprocity. But the important thing is that it's very asymmetric. So 
uh, are most of the obligations are on the European party, and most of the rights are on the West African party, for obvious reasons, because we are different level of development. There are flexible rules of origin, I will explain what they are. There is a net large number of safeguard measures to protect infant uh, industry and sensitive sectors in West Africa, and there are a number of financial and technical uh, uh, support provisions to help meet the EU standards, to, uh, export, to help and support export of goods. What the EPA doesn't deal with so far is services, investment, intellectual property, and competition law. These are, these are topics which uh, um, the idea is to negotiate, to, uh, to broaden the scope of the agreement as soon as, uh, as, the, as the, 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 the EPA enters into force, negotiations will start to include also other, other possible sectors. But since there is a lot of sensitivity, the first experience actually West Africa doesn't have any uh, trade agreement with any part of the world. It was, it was decided after a request of West Africa to limit this agreement only to trade on goods, trading goods, eh? no services. So how does, uh, how does uh, EPA work? At least the trade chapter, eh? because this is not just an agreement, of, it's not just a free trade agreement. It is a, a trade and development agreement. There is a big chapter on uh, cooperation, on standards, customs, will provide to West Africa in order to make sure that the objectives of the EPA are achieved. But the, the, the market offering, the trade part of the agreement, which is what normally people tend to focus more, is, is, uh, is this in a nutshell. The European Union, when the agreement will enter into force, will open 100% will be duty-free and quota-free. So no, no duty when you're exporting to the European Union. On the other end, West Africa, and that's a concept of reciprocity I mentioned before, will have to open a part of its market, but only 75%. And only on sectors which are not sensitive, but actually they are supportive of industrialization. So basically, the, the sectors where um, uh, West Africa will have gradually, eh, because the uh, European Union will have to open immediately from the first day of entry to most of the agreement, whilst West Africa will do it over a period of 20 years. It's a staggered market opening, uh, which takes place uh, every five years or, or in a period of, of, of 20 years. Uh, it is only about uh, the products which are actually uh, necessary by the local industry uh, uh, for, for, their, for their production processes. So it would be raw materials, capital goods, machinery, um, inputs, spare parts. This is actually what uh, the market opening is, uh, the market access offer of the EPA requires for West Africa. To open imports from Europe of inputs materials, which I believe should be beneficial for the local industries because of course there are already so many costs of production. If we are reducing the cost of the inputs by uh, reducing the cost of the import duty, reducing the import duty, that should be beneficial to the industry. That's the idea, to use trade to boost and to support the industrialization of West Africa and not to uh, actually, which is a lot of products I will, I will mention. And basically all consumer, Finnish and consumer goods, where precisely there is a potential for the local industry to serve the market, and there is already a quite active industry, particularly in Nigeria, uh, to protect those industries, uh, this has been excluded from uh, the obligation of market opening of West Africa. So that means that uh, West Africa will still be able to impose import duties, which go up to 35%, so quite high, high custom duties, on imports coming from, uh, from Europe of all consumer goods. It might be you know, clothing, it might be uh, you know, uh, cars, uh, or any other kind of thing you can, food and beverage, uh, and basically all agricultural products, because that is also food security is something very important for West Africa. So the agricultural sector has been excluded. So it will still be able to protect the agricultural sector. So how does it work? As I say, the market opening for West Africa is staggered over a period of 20 years. It's very gradual. The reason why this has been done is because, well, first of all, to allow the adaptation of uh, the local industry, but in principle, you know, these are, are goods where there is no such a thriving and strong local industry. So the, the reason is not really to give protection, but of course, at the same time, yes, it does give protection if there is an asset industry, an infant industry in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, in, in pro providing some raw materials or some or some uh, input, some uh, some intermediate goods. Uh, uh, I know that there is an effort also to, of backward integration in Nigeria, uh, to give an example, uh, there is a raw material initiative. So, uh, you know, there is a need also to protect 
this uh, this efforts to back or backward integration. So you know, in order to allow a, a, some protection, eh, the the, uh, the market opening uh, even for the material which are needed by the industry, as I say, for their local production, has been delayed over a period. Has been staggered over a period of 20 years. But the main reason why this uh, the, 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 the period of uh, market opening for West Africa is 20 years is also to allow the West African countries to, uh, uh, to, to implement a fiscal transition because, as you know, one of the main problems of uh, many, many West African countries, I think probably of many African countries, is the over-reliance on import duties as a source of revenue. Uh, so, uh, and this is, a, this is a problem affecting also Nigeria. There, there is not an efficient um, fiscal system, and, and this is one of the things actually which the current government is trying to address with, by broadening the, 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 tax, the tax net to reach uh, as many uh, individuals or companies as possible. So to improve and to make more efficient the tax system, corporate and individual uh, uh, um, tax system, perhaps uh, in the medium or long term increase the VAT, uh, and Nigeria is one of the lowest in the world. Actually, that, that is the way to, rent, to make revenues, government revenues, more stable, more predictable, uh, uh, rather than depending, depending on uh, import revenues, which actually may vary over time. Now, now for instance, that, uh, that Nigeria has been importing less, also due to certain policies, which are understandable, of import substitution, etc. Of course, import duties reduce, and this reduces, of course, uh, the uh, government revenue. So the idea is to replace gradually the, uh, um, the, the revenues coming from uh, import duties with a more stable and more efficient fiscal system. So we give this 20 years time to make sure that there is no impact on government revenues. And uh, as I said also, uh, if there is any infant industry in those sectors also to give them enough protection, I think 20 years protection is quite good. Uh, otherwise, if you, don't, if, you, if you allow protection forever, the industry will never be infant or will be infant forever, which is not good. So protectionism is good, but it should, have, it should be limited in time. As I said, 25% of tariff lines mainly finished consumer goods, agricultural products, food and beverage are excluded. I, I can give you just an example of list of agricultural products that are excluded. So on these goods, West Africa will still be able to impose import duties. And it's just a little meat, meat products, fish, dairy products, vegetables, rice, vegetable oil, sugar, water, tobacco products and the list continues, on industrial products, cement and paints, pharmaceutical products, soap, candles and matches. I think also toothpicks, I, I didn't mention, but I'm sure toothpicks are also excluded. Um, plastic products, bags, suitcases, wood, and uh, wood might be within the toothpicks. Uh, textile, clothing, and fruits, vehicles. Now, vehicles is a very good example. There is a, an automotive policy which has been implemented by the Nigerian government with an, uh, industrial revolution plans since the previous administration, which has been continued now. And it's very much in line with, uh, with the EPA, actually. The EPA allows uh, Nigeria to impose duties on import of final vehicles, but it has low duties on the importation of components which are needed to, to build the vehicle. Batteries, various seats, ceramic and glass products, iron steel products. So this is to give an example. When I hear the concern, ah, but EPA, if it is signed, we're going to be flooded by European products. It's not true. Most of these products which are produced here are excluded from the, from the EPA, from the obligation to, of liberalization of market opening of West Africa. So that means that these products, which is sectors which are sensitive, we understand there is a potential, they are excluded. So the local industry shouldn't have any fear. What are the benefits? I will list. I will try to list and make some example of the main benefits of the EPA for the for the Nigerian industry. Well, I, just, I already mentioned you okay. to free access to EU market, improve rules of origin, dismantling of duties on imports of machinery and uh, and inputs, protection on imports of consumer and finished goods from the EU. I already mentioned them all, but now we give example one by one and go a little bit more in detail. And then the last part, the EPA development program. Uh, so there are uh, development cooperation support to improve the infrastructure, to improve the standards and the quality of wood exported to the EU. So the main advice is removal of import duties to the EU. So you probably know that the European Union is the main partner, 
trade partner of, uh, of Nigeria and actually of West Africa. Uh, the European Union is the main export destination of uh, Nigeria, uh, Nigerian exports, the main destination. And uh, unfor the unfortunate thing is that 96% of the exports are, are composed of oil products. And there are only 4%, about 4% of non-oil products. But even then, the EU still remains the main export destination also of non-oil products. So we are the main trading partner when it comes to exports. Now, you can imagine, on some of the particular, of, of course, the oil, the, when you are exporting oil, this is not subject to duties because we need oil. So we, 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 didn't, we didn't pay subject to duty. But since, we, in, in order with the WTO rules, we have to comply, we couldn't give complete free access as they say, on some other goods, particularly uh, non-oil goods, um, we apply some duties. Now, if the duties were removed, of course, the immediate benefit would, would be already for the non-oil export you are, you are doing now, you will, you will, of course, increase the value of the exports, and you will increase, uh, you know, uh, the revenues for the exporters of those goods. So that would be the immediate, the immediate advantage that you will, uh, you will obtain. I just show you a list of what are the main, the ten main uh, exports from Nigeria to the European Union. You see, oil and gas is uh, number one, about makes about ninety five and six percent. And you have cocoa and preparation, skins and leather, fish, food. Seeds, rubber, copper, wood, and charcoal. The cocoa sector, well, as I say, as you see here from the list, cocoa is number one non oil export from uh, uh, Nigeria to the EU. And Nigeria, this is the fourth largest global producer of cocoa. About 80% of uh, cocoa produced in Nigeria is exported as cocoa beans. Cocoa beans is the raw material. And that's the unfortunate thing. Even when it comes to non-oil export to Europe, you are rather exporting raw materials rather than processed goods. And this is precisely the purpose of the EPA, to, to, to stop this trend and to change it completely and to allow it to be able to export also processed goods. Because we have the potential, we have the industry, we have the capacity. But now we're exporting processed cocoa, for instance, cocoa powder, cocoa butter, etc. You are facing duties. When, it goes, when, it, when it's not a raw material, but it becomes a, a process material, there are some duties applicable. And indeed, they are between 2.8 and 6.1. So when, when Nigeria wants to export uh, processed cocoa, it faces this duty between 2 and uh, between 3, about 6%. So by, if the EPA enters into force, as I say, the immediate effect will be immediate increase in the value of the already existing exports of uh, uh, raw materials and also of the small uh, exports, there are already small exports of uh, processed cocoa. But in particular, it will boost the processing of uh, cocoa inside Nigeria. It doesn't make sense that, that you will only export raw materials. You have the capacity to process it and to export already something which uh, would improve the industrialization, the processing, and create jobs in, in Nigeria. So the removal of duties will, of course, uh, will of course increase is the processing in the sector. Another, another example is the leather industry. I was, uh, I was, uh, in, uh, I was visiting ABBA uh, a few weeks ago, and I was impressed by uh, you know, the, 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 the activity, uh, the productivity, the cluster of uh, producers of leather, uh, the, uh, the, 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 and the quality. I mean, there is so much potential. But when you're exporting a finished product, even when you're exporting leather now to Europe, you're facing duties. 6.5%. And yet, already, you have 4.3% of the EU market in leather. So if we remove duties, also this export will boost. And also, uh, the, the production of, uh, of, uh, of shoes, of finished products of leather, will boost as well. An example from Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a least developed country. They certainly face a lot of problems. I suppose probably even more than Nigeria. They, 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 they certainly have a problem of access to electricity, they are constantly flooded, uh, but, they, they, but they, they manage to benefit from the free access because least developed countries, they can, compatible with WTO rules, they can export duty-free quota free to Europe. And what they, they, they took advantage of this free access to the European Union to become one of the first and the leading countries in the world in the textile sector, textile and garment. You must know there are a lot of Italians eh, that go to Bangladesh to invest there, and to, and to buy textile and garments, t-shirts, etc., to export them to, to Italy. When there was a terrorist attack in Dhaka, uh, I think it was last year or two years ago, in a the restaurant, there were like 90 guys that were killed. 
they were there making their investment. They were investing in Bangladesh because Bangladesh was actually a hub to export textile and garment to Europe. And it's because the export is zero duty. And when you are competing in a global world, uh, where any little margin can make the difference and make your product more competitive, I can tell you that, you know, if you pay a 12% or a 9.56% of duties on a, on a t-shirt, that's a lot. They can make your, your, they can kill your product. So that is the advantage Bangladesh tried to explore. And it's not only Bangladesh, many other countries, even Tanzania, to make an, another example, I will cite, I will quote later Madagascar, they managed to explore this free access to successfully to the European Union to develop their textile and garment industry, which I think is key. Nigeria was very good for very the end of the 90s. And it can regain, take leadership, thanks to this, to this scheme, to this preferential access to Europe. An important benefit that uh, the agreement will provide is the improved rules of origin. What are the rules of origin? Well, the rules of origin are what, what determines whether a good is originating from a certain country. You need, of course, to establish whether a good is uh, from Nigeria in order to know whether it will enter zero, uh, zero duty to the European market. And how do you establish whether a good is really Nigerian or is not Chinese or is not coming from, uh, I don't know, from, uh, from Korea and it's only been uh, added a bit, very little value which doesn't let it qualify, allow it to qualify as a, as a Nigerian good. Well, currently, Nigeria pays duties when it is exposed to, to Europe, but it still has a, has a, a preferential access. As it has a special treatment as a developing country. So now currently to qualify as a Nigerian good uh, to be exported to, um, to uh, this, 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 uh, this shows, for instance, even a t-shirt, um, how much processing it, it, it goes, in, I mean, inputs can come from any part of the world, even just simply a t-shirt. How do you qualify where it is made? Is it the, the final transformation when it's actually cut? Uh, or it is uh, actually the fabric which determines the origin of the t-shirt? Well, what are the current rules? Well, currently to consider as a, as a Nigerian t-shirt, which qualifies for a 9.6% duty when it is exported to Europe, which is a preferential duty, right? because I say Nigeria as, as a developing country has a preferential duty compared to the, to the most favorable nation rate under the WTO rules, which is 12%. 9.6% is a preferential duty, but in order to benefit from this duty, you have to show that this t-shirt is coming really from Nigeria. How do you qualify a t-shirt as being an Nigerian t-shirt? Well, today it needs, to, it needs two transformation processes. Welling accompanied by making up, including cutting. So basically, you need to have the fabric done in Nigeria, and then you need, to, you need to, the actual t-shirt to be actually cut and designed. So it's two transformation processes. This, of course, makes it much more difficult to qualify for exports under the privilege, under the favorable rate of 9.6%. Under the EPA, the rules will be much more relaxed. It will be sufficient one transformation. So you could take the fabric from wherever you want. You just, you just manufacture, you just manufacture from fabric. One transformation, and that t-shirt is an Agena t-shirt, which can enter duty-free European Union. So you can replicate the success of Bangladesh. You can replicate the success that we mentioned later on, Madagascar and other countries. Then the benefit number three, this monthly of import duties. I already mentioned that. Yes, it's true, reciprocity. West Africa has to open 75% of its market to imports from Europe. But which, in, which imports? Which imports? Well, the imports which the local industry needs. It's not imports which are going to undermine, which are going to affect, which are going to uh, attempt that, as the, to put at risk the industrialization of West Africa. But the other way around, these are imports which are needed by the local industry. But the local industry is already importing and is spending money, more money than it would spend if the duties were not there. Just to give you an example, the forex, the 41 forex policy of the Central Bank of Nigeria. You must have heard how much it has affected the local industry. Why? Because these 40, 41 items, which is actually about 800 uh, category of goods, that's 41 items, and if you look at the tariff lines, it's about 800 different type of goods. Most of them are raw materials and inputs, which the local industry needs. So making the access to forex to buy these inputs has put a lot of pressure on the local industry. Many companies have to close down because these inputs are needed, simply because they are needed. So uh, by the lights are closed. Can anybody help me to, 
in the projector. So by removing the import duties on raw materials inputs, this will of course benefit the local industry. It will not undermine, it will favor, it will support the local industry. And this is the benefit, of, and just to make another example, recently the Minister of Finance has issued the, uh, the new list of so-called national goods. We know that when the CET, the Common External Tariff of the West Africa was applied, it was possible for the ECOWAS member states uh, to, uh, for a transitional period, to make variation to this, uh, to this uh, common external tariff. So to uh, apply tariffs which were in excess to protect certain, certain sectors, but also to lower the duties. And this is the so-called so national rules. Recently, in December, I think the Minister of Finance issued the national list, and many goods are actually, uh, actually a duty which is lower than the, than, the, than the duty applicable according to the common external tariff to show again that on certain, on certain imports it's good to have low duties because they are actually necessary for local production. Um, well, I wanted to show the example of, uh, well, the benefit number four is the duty we still apply on imports of finished process and consumer goods. I wanted to give you some examples of when textile, but I find it's not possible to show the slides. But benefit number four is precisely you still be able to protect your local industry. So on textile, you just to give an example, textile you will be able to export duty free, but you will, you, will, you will not face competition coming from Europe. Although I must say, unfortunately, also the European textile industry is dead to the Chinese, to the Chinese exports. So it's not only the Nigerian industry which has su suffered, the Nigerian manufa uh, textile manufacturing industry, but also the European one. So that is another reason why you shouldn't fear any imports coming from Europe and competing with the, with the, with the Nigerian industry. Uh, but in any event, there will be duties still applicable. So there shouldn't be any concern. Thank you. I think it's a Yeah, I wanted to show. Yes, this is an example, this is an annex to the EPA, which shows exactly, you can see how it works, the liberalization for 75% of goods is staggered over a period of 20 years, you see, first year, first five years, first 10 years, first 20 years. The category D products, which are 25 of the tariff lines are excluded, and an clear example is the textile sector, you see. Any woven fabric of cotton, Containing more than 8%, it will be excluded. So it means that according to the CT of these goods, you can still apply 10% of import duties. For some of these, which are more processed goods, you can still apply 20% of import duties. Another example, agribusiness industry. I mentioned the cocoa sector before. You will be able to export, to export cocoa powder, cocoa butter uh, to, to Europe uh, duty-free, not only cocoa beans, but on the other way around, you will, still, you will be able to protect. When you start to process, when your industry starts to grow, you will be able to produce chocolate yourself. You don't, have, you don't have to import chocolate. You will be able to produce chocolate. So you, you should protect your industry. And as you see, when it comes to all cocoa processed products, including also co cocoa tablets uh, uh, and any preparation from cocoa, you will be able to protect it with duties up to 35%. So this is to protect your cocoa industry. You will be able to export and will be able to protect your local industry from imports. And then benefit number five. A very strong development cooperation program accompanies the EPA. This is an important part of the agreement. The European Union is committed to continuous development cooperation support. We have been here since 19, 1976. The European Union delegation is opened in Lagos in 1976. It has started, it started as a donor agency, and it still continues to be mainly active in giving grants to support development and, and sustainable development and industrialization of, uh, of West Africa, or Nigeria. And Nigeria. And for the next five years, the US pledged 6.5 billion to support the objectives of the EPA. So we're not simply saying we remove our duties and then and then you take care of finding a way to enter our market. No, we are providing support because we are aware of the infrastructure problems. So we have a very strong pro uh, a program to support the power sector. And actually, one of the presentations will be given this afternoon by a representative of GSZ is actually a program. Uh, co-funded by the EU, uh, 
on the um, mini grids. And for the next five years, in Nigeria only, the, uh, the European Union is investing 150 million euro to support the power sector. And be aware, these are not loans; these are grants. So, just given money given for free, which combined with loans, we can attract even more investments and boost and um, boost the sector. And this is just an example. We are just in the phase, in phase of finalization of uh, the competitiveness support program for West Africa. And in Nigeria in particular, this program will be also implemented at, at each uh, member state of uh, your ECOWAS, um, uh, um, the ECOWAS region. And in Nigeria, we have identified the textile and garment sector as a sector where we are going to provide particularly support, like capacity building and, uh, and any other support that the industry will require in order to accompany the implementation of the EPA. So now let me come to the, the question I normally receive. So I anticipate your question. And this, but what is the benefit? Why is the EPA doing all this? Well, the answer is very simple. The EU is not using this agreement as a means to enter a huge and lucrative market, as I always, uh, very often at least, I hear. We're not using trade here, we're not using uh, trade as an instrument to uh, penetrate the market, but we are using trade as, a, as an instrument to support development. And why we're doing so? Because for us to have stability and prosperity uh, among our neighbors is essential to ensure the stability and prosperity of the European Union. Because whatever happens at our borders, now we immediately feel it also in Europe. In Europe. If there is a problem, if there is a war instability, if there is, a, you, you see, I mean, we are flooded by people who, of course, they are, they are trying to, they are trying to find shelter in Europe and they, they are trying to look for a better life. And this, of course, creates also instability in Europe. I believe personally that one of the reasons which might have moved some, uh, some uh, British people to vote for the exit from the, from, of, uh, of the UK from the European Union might also be the fear that this flux of migrants, which is putting a lot of pressure, particularly in my, in my own country, Italy, that might also affect the UK. So, you see, whatever happens at our borders, it has an indirect impact also in Europe, and we cannot ignore it. So, by ensuring the stability, the prosperity of West Africa, we ensure also a long-term stability and prosperity of the European Union. Of course, there are also some short benefits, uh, short-term benefits for the EU, some EU industries, only those exporting, there's, there's those sophisticated inputs uh, or materials uh, which will probably a little bit improve due to the removal over a period of 20 years, by the way, so not even short term of, uh, of, uh, of import duties from West Africa. And then, of course, uh, another advantage is we're looking investment, uh, places to invest. European investors are looking, for, are looking for places to invest. And I can tell you, if West Africa becomes a hub from which you can export duty-free to Europe, you will see what is happening in Bangladesh. Well, Italians going there to invest. They will come here to invest. So investment will be boosted. And of course, in the long, very long term, if the prosperity is ensured and, 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 and many, many uh, Nigerians become more wealthy, of course, hopefully, then we will be able to sell more to them as well in the long term. Now, there are concerns. What happens if, for instance, there are some sectors which were not protected and should have been protected? I mentioned the raw materials initiative. There might be sectors all of a sudden which get a very strong support from a government, and therefore you need to protect that industry. For that, there are uh, safeguard measures. So if you have an infant industry and you want to protect that industry, you can still suspend the tariff dismantlement. That is over it. You can suspend it. You can never increase tariffs or introduce tariff quotas. So there is a lot of flexibility in the agreement, and this is only in favor of West Africa. Only West Africa can activate and can trigger this clause. Then there is a review of tariff commitments. Even on the tariff which the West, uh, West African party has agreed to dismantle, it is possible to review them. It's another flexibility that, of course, only the West African party has. And finally, the review clause. Every five years, if anything goes wrong, the agreement can be completely reviewed. So let me come now to some of, perhaps again, anticipating some of your questions. What are the concerns usually raised against the EPA, which in, 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 in my view are not justified? Well, the, I already mentioned, probably, I already mentioned this uh, during my presentation. Well, as what I hear very often, the Nigerian market will be flooded by cheap European products. The infant industry will suffer, jobs will be lost. 
well, the first reaction is European products are not cheap. Uh, if it, uh, unfortunately, uh, that is not the uh, quality we have. Uh, our products they tend to be a bit more expensive than others. So even if they were imported duty free, uh, there shouldn't be a concern. But in any event, as I explained, an important part of the agreement is to protect sensitive sectors. So 25% of target lines have been excluded, and therefore duties will apply at least to those sectors where you shouldn't fear any competition coming from Europe because you will still be able to apply duties up to 35%. And then there are the safeguard measures that I just mentioned. Another, another concern I very usually raised, oh, but Nigeria will suffer, will suffer fiscal losses. Well, I already addressed that at the very beginning of my presentation. Why this dismantlement is over a period of 20 years precisely to allow fiscal transition and to avoid a very bad impact on fiscal revenues. In any event, the World Bank, they've done a study on what would be the loss of, uh, of fiscal revenues due to the removal, the gradual removal over 20 years of duties. This is a start concerning Nigeria in particular, and it predicts a loss of only 0.8% of the total fiscal revenue and 3.3% of non oil revenue. Of course, assuming that there is no fiscal transition. If there is fiscal transition, this, this would be compensated by the, a, a better and more efficient fiscal system. Um, and finally, something, no, something that I hear as well as often is Nigeria will not be able to export anything to Europe. Okay, it's true that now it's not exporting very much, but we will hear the presentation from, uh, from my friend Shevon uh, after mine. The effort now is precisely to diversify and improve exports of non oil goods. So if you already say we're not going to be able to export, well, then you're not looking forward. You're not forward looking. You have to look. And you have to take the seize opportunities that EPA will offer. The main partner destination for your non-oil goods is Europe. It will still remain Europe for a long time. So seize this opportunity. If you can export duty-free, you certainly your program to boost export, to diversify export, will be even more successful. And uh, the last, uh, the last concern I sometimes hear: Well, Nigeria could not strike a better deal with uh, with other with other countries in the world. Okay. It's not true. Uh, even after the EPA signed it into force, Nigeria is very free, actually probably the region, because if you want to have a, 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 a real region, a, a real economic integration, you have to have a commercial policy. So like the European Union negotiating free trade agreement with the rest of the world as a block, it should be again the ECOWAS region negotiating agreement, not, not uh, Nigeria. But in event, be it Nigeria or be the ECOWAS member state, the ECOWAS region, you will still be able to enter into other agreements with any other of the world. So they shouldn't be concerned that this agreement prevents you from striking a better deal with other partners. Although I frankly don't know what better deal you can you can strike if you have access of 100% of a market. What can you get? What can you get as a better deal than that? And just to conclude, a case study of Madagascar. Madagascar signed an EPA. Sorry, it's not 2018, 2009. Eh? Together with other countries, Seychelles, I mentioned before. Well, since the signature of this, in the entry to force of this agreement. The exports of Madagascar to Europe has increased by 14%. Who has benefited more is the textile and apparel sector, which saw an increase, an enormous increase uh, every year. And now this is the main export of Madagascar to Europe. 30, 300 million euros, accounting for 32% of Madagascar total export to Europe. And this thanks to the, all the benefits I listed before. So what is the way forward? But the way forward is this agreement has to be signed by everybody. As I say, three signatures are missing. We hope that they will be soon uh, secured. Once the agreement has been signed by all parties, then there is an, a ratification process. Many national assemblies uh, will be involved into this process. Uh, but as soon as two-thirds of the West African countries will have ratified the agreement will be able to enter into force provisionally. And then, of course, there, are a lot, there is a, an institutional framework we will set up. It's not just an agreement uh, 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 living alone, but you need, a, 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 you need some, some infrastructure, some uh, institutions to make it work. So there will be an EPA council, an implementation committee, and parliamentary committee. Very important, an observatory on competitiveness. So there is, a, there is actually an entity which will be, will be given the task to monitor that the agreement achieves its objective. So that it supports industrialization and that all the, all the, all the benefits which are listed are achieved. Because if it doesn't achieve its objective, then something will have to be changed. And it's important to have somebody who is actually collecting statistic data 
and making sure that, that the implementation of the EPA is very well monitored in order to make sure that it achieves its objectives. And with this, I conclude. Thank you very much for the patience of listening to all this. I'm very happy to see questions. presentation on the EPA and, uh, and the advantages that will accrue uh, once uh, it's been signed and ratified. Are there any questions at all for uh, Filippo on, on uh, the EPA and anything else, actually? I already answered many questions. <laughs> it was so comprehensive, there's no questions. Um, okay, uh, I think Filippo has some uh, um, handouts which we'll pass around and, uh, and drop through to you. Uh, um, sometime this morning. Sean? Yes, it's a short brochure on the on the benefits. I listed five, but uh, some of my colleagues managed to, to list ten. <laughs> so give the double of what. So this is a brochure for your benefit if you want uh, somebody who needs the support. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. Enormous thank you, Filippo. Uh, I know it was uh, quite an effort to get here from. Thank you. Right, um, so we're, we're, we're heating up nicely for today. Um, we are very fortunate indeed to have uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Nigerian Export Promotion uh, Council, uh, Honorable Ulushegmo Awulawo, uh, here with us. Um, we are very fortunate, and uh, um, Shegmo will go through with, with us uh, what we're doing as a country to exploit the enormous benefits of uh, the export uh, sector for Nigeria. Shekhar, thank, thank you. Now first let me apologize for uh, coming in uh, a bit late. We had another program with the South African uh, Embassy and they have a delegation of uh, businessmen. And, and I felt uh, with what is happening, uh, it's it's uh, good to show respect and show up there, uh, and uh, which is what I did. And I excuse myself to to come here, so I apologise for that. Let me also uh, quickly thank uh, Filippo. And uh, any time Filippo makes uh, this EPA uh, presentations, you just want to get out your pen and sign. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, let me also assure him that we are looking at it and uh, we had the trade um, uh, advisor to the minister uh, go to Brussels to talk to the, uh, the EU EPA advisor there and uh, we are looking at what we can, we can do on the EPA. Uh, let, me, let me also thank the uh, particularly DG, uh, the very tenacious uh, Mr. Doherty, uh, for arranging this. And uh, I thank the, the ambassador, the members of the, uh, the Norwegian, uh, Nigerian Norwegian uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, for uh, uh, doing, doing this. And it's good I'm speaking after uh, Filippo. Trying to understand this. Uh, yeah, I don't because I don't know why everybody doesn't use Apple. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, well, it, it's nice to, to speak after Filippo because uh, he, he, he has told you really uh, our major concerns about uh, the EPA uh, and about uh, the, uh, the European market. Uh, and in doing that, he has made my job a lot easier because what is really important is what Nigeria can export uh, to the world aside from oil. And so we embarked on this, uh, it's called Achieving Zero Oil in, in Nigeria. And that's, that's the program where we're working on. It feeds on the Nigerian Industrial Revolution Plan. And we take the key from 
Mr. President, who uh, in frustration addressing the Nigerian Manufacturers Association and uh, told them that Nigeria must begin to behave as if it has no oil at all. Uh, I think the man really got frustrated uh, with that. So we asked the following questions about our future. What if Nigeria had no oil? We'll, how would we survive? Uh, what else will we sell? I mean, export to the world. Uh, what impact will it have in creating jobs and, and wealth? And how quickly can we prepare for a Nigeria with zero oil? So that is the new vision we're setting for the country on what is possible in Nigeria. And uh, on that, we have the zero oil plan, which I'm going to share with you. When you look at Nigerian exports as percentage to GDP, it's, it's quite low. Uh, the figure you see there is 18%. But when you remove crude oil, it's only 1%. And that for us, it's really sad because if we did not have crude oil, our exports will account for one third of the total exports of Trinidad and Tobago, a country that is only 1% of Nigeria's population and far less than down, of course. And this is a, a big cause for worry. Well, you can see the emerging issues due to low oil prices. Uh, and this is what is happening in the country now. And that's why, why we are now officially in a, in a, in a recession. But we say we need an export revolution. And I always say Nigeria doesn't have an oil price problem uh, because really it's not for us to determine uh, mostly oil prices. So it doesn't fall within our control. But what we have is an export inertia problem because we have just refused to export other things than oil. And this is now uh, our objective. This is our revolution. And we say we track it from uh, number one in the box. Objectives grow foreign income, because that's really the big challenge. And what are we going to offer? Increase export and distribution of Nigerian goods. Uh, we create market, market access. Where will this come from? And that's a big thing on the plan. We need to grow rare sector output in manufacturing, in agribusiness, in industrial like gas, and in solid minerals. What will make us preferable to others? We need to improve our competitiveness. Uh, create, like Filippo or Oloa led to, better infrastructure. Uh, we need better regulations and we need to meet international uh, standards. And uh, he also alluded to it, what is happening in the power sector uh, because that is really the killer here for industry and manufacturing in Nigeria. Now, what are the spillover effects? Of course, increased linkages all across small business, adjacent industries, you create new technology to drive this. We will do the work, you are going to create more jobs when you open uh, your, you grow your real sector output. You're going to create more jobs, more jobs and uh, skills are going to come in and more technology. And we will provide the resources, yes, that's what we're looking for, more investments. Uh, uh, foreign direct investments, uh, local investments, this time into manufacturing and industry. We have seen one of the sharpest falls in oil <coughs> income in Nigerian history. And uh, just yesterday, I, I was uh, speaking at another forum, and I had to call uh, Dr. Yebi Kale, the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, because I wanted a figure uh, for oil exports uh, 2016. Uh, but the figure he gave me was in Naira, and uh, it was 6.9 trillion naira. And I said, okay, what exchange do I use? And, and he said I should use from 197 to 300 and something. Uh, I said, I don't have the calculator to do that. <laughs> so, but uh, the figure you have is 2014, Nigeria had $70 billion uh, from oil. 2015, it's come down to $40 billion. And by the rough calculation we're having with Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, 6.9 uh, billion naira, you're falling short of 40 
billion dollars in 2016. And that's the challenge because you lost uh, 30 billion dollars and you have an import bill of about 50 billion dollars. And that's why in a rush and uh, Filippo had led to it, the president's disgust that uh, we were still importing toothpicks, uh, the famous toothpick uh, economic challenge, so to speak. So that is it. You've lost $30 billion. You have an import bill of $50 billion. How do you service it? Of course, that means you don't have foreign exchange. So Nigeria needs uh, an extra $30 billion from non-oil exports to be able to secure our future. And that's, that's the vision, and it's a bold strategy. But we say no, it's, not, uh, it's nothing new. Many other countries have pursued such a bold strategy uh, before to increase their uh, earnings from, from non-oil exports. The example is Brazil, Egypt, Indonesia, and of course, uh, Vietnam is, is the kid on the block for that. How Vietnam was able to move in the last 30 years, uh, a ravaged uh, uh, one nation, but they have moved to move from being number one importer of rice in, in the world to now the number one exporter of rice in the world. So these are possible uh, things that can, that can happen. So that's the Nigerian vision uh, on the Zero Oil Plan. We look at it and we say, look, the world top exporters, uh, they, they, they tend to be weathered than other nations. And when you look at this map, uh, you can see, of course, China, I don't need to speak more about China. It's just an exporting uh, uh, country. They export everything there. And they have revenues of all, almost $2.4 $2 trillion in exports. And then you go to United States after waking up, after the, the economic uh, challenges. Uh, President Obama set up the President Exports Council, and everything was about exporting. And they, 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 they jumped over Germany in that. Uh, regard, uh, but look at the figures. But when you look at Russia, Russia is doing uh, 498 uh, uh, billion dollars, uh, but that is on oil. And you can see all the other countries are even richer than than Russia. The United the United Kingdom is uh, is is far more better than Russia, even with Russian oil. And when you look at UAE, United Arab Emirates, and South Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Mexico is on top of them, because Mexico has benefited under the uh, NAFTA, the, the, the North uh, American Free Trade Agreement. And they are able to uh, advance their own manufacturing, and they are exporting to, to the United States of America. Uh, if the world is not uh, the wall is not built, uh, that's another challenge uh, for them. But look at look at those figures, and you can see that the so-called oil countries are not wealthier than the other uh, trading and exporting uh, nations. So th those are objectives. Really, is to uh, add an additional hundred and fifty billion. Uh, billion dollars to our foreign reserves uh, over the next 10 years, uh, create at least 500,000 additional jobs, and to lift uh, 10 million Nigerians out of pro poverty. Uh, China did it, they lifted 600 million Chinese out of poverty. So it's, it's something that can, that can be done. So we say Nigeria will survive in a world where we sell no more oil. And uh, that's it. And it's a bold vision. And the phase we are in now today is bulk goods. We are ready to just take any bulk goods out of the country and uh, we get to the next stage where we are looking at retail and branded products when our uh, industries uh, move from infant uh, to, to solid industries. We, we, we start to export more based on the brands. And uh, we now move to the high-tech uh, goods when we, are full, we have been able to really develop our national industrial uh, development plan. So that's the zero oil in a nutshell with the export sectors and uh, the, that's the pyramid is it's, it's, it's on and I'll be mentioning that. Now the sectors we, we chose to replace crude oil uh, were carefully selected 
And uh, we have three major criteria for selecting this. One, the size of the product traded internationally. Uh, that's the financial value of that product. Uh, for the purpose of this role, we were looking at products traded above $20 billion uh, globally, and uh, annually. And we looked at the relative ease of operating in that sector, uh, the degree of complexity that uh, avails in that sector. And then we fall back on our natural ability uh, for the country. That's the, our comparative uh, advantage. And when you look at the bubble box, uh, you, you see uh, how it is. And the redder it is, the more uh, advantageous it is, uh, of course, for Nigeria. And I'll just mention two here. Uh, one is petrochemicals. Now, that, that is really a very sad story for Nigeria because that's an $150 billion business annually, globally. But Nigeria is not there. Rather, we're importing, and yet we're a petrol economy. So you can see the why government is all out to support the uh, refinery, uh, the uh, Aliko Dangote uh, is embarking upon in Nigeria. And we're calling for more of those kind of investments those are the kind of FDIs that we even think will interest uh, Norway. Uh, because you have been able to build a sovereign wealth fund that is phenomenal by not just spending your, 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 your oil uh, uh, money. And you, you see what it is. And so we need investments in that to build this kind of uh, refineries, be it modular refineries, all across the country. And we can uh, tap into this. The uh, ambassador of, uh, of the former ambassador to of Iran to Nigeria. One of my first visitors when I came to the office, and he said, "Listen, what are you guys really, really doing? Uh, you only have one petrochemical plant. That's the now taken over by uh, Indorama, the LMA petrochemical plant. He said, you need to replicate it. You need to have about 20 of that all across your country, so you can sell petroleum products." Because when we were under sanctions uh, from the Western world, the, sanction, the, the sanctions were on oil, not non-oil. So we built refineries all over, and we could uh, export all over our, our area. Uh, you can do the same in, in ECOWAS. Uh, we will export uh, petroleum uh, products. And with that, we are getting revenue of over $40 billion. So what are you, what are you waiting for? Really, and that, that was the message. So that petrochemicals is key. I'll just mention another one here, with maybe two more, where rice, which if we look at the Vietnam example, this is what we're doing. Now rice is the number one imported uh, uh, goods from in Nigeria, in Ghana, all across uh, 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 West Africa. But yet we can grow it. And that's the, the vision and the thing now we're looking at. It's also an import substitution uh, kind of uh, business. You grow more and then you, 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 you import less and then get ready to export, export rice. So you can tap into this $25 uh, billion uh, annually uh, market that is there. Cocoa is another sad one uh, when, you, when, you, when you look at that. And it's uh, Côte d'Ivoire is now almost 2 million uh, metric tons. Uh, Ghana is edging close to 900,000. Uh, Nigeria is still on 250,000. So there is a considerable fact that we need to raise uh, uh, production. And what the zero oil plan is calling for is increased productivity all across many of these sectors so we can uh, get into the, into the market. Yeah, we all, the Zero Plan will also pro, uh, provide alternate platforms to boost the exports of the less liquid uh, products and sectors. Now, these are the ones trading below $20 billion. And uh, your, uh, this, uh, your famous, uh, uh, these are your uh, items on, on, on that. And when you look at what, let me mention two here as well. What do we look at? What has been achieved in cement? under the Nigerian Industrial Revolution Plan is just an example of what is possible. 
because uh, uh, Aliko Dangote will always tell you that, look, with 2,000 uh, megawatts of power, we're able to raise cement. And now Nigeria, from being a net importer of cement, Nigeria doesn't import cement anymore. We're now an exporter of cement. Indeed, we, uh, the Dangote Group exported cement uh, last year uh, from Nigeria for the first time. So it just shows you it's possible. Another we'll talk about is, uh, is Cashew. I think uh, one of our uh, processors and Cashew guy is going to be speaking all, also uh, at this. So I won't take I won't take his turn that way. But Cashew is 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 also very uh, very very significant. Cashew can grow all across the 36 states of Nigeria, but we're yet still on. Now I think we're on about 170,000 metric tons or so. Uh, but a couple of years ago, we, I'll just share this with you. We were in Vietnam and pushing this, we don't want to sell raw materials. We want to sell processed goods uh, kind of philosophy. And I was addressing them and chatting with them. And the man said, listen, Mr. Wolo, you, you produce 130,000 metric tons. We bought 120,000 metric tons of this year cashew. What is really left to process? You have to go back, replant more trees, grow more cashew, and then come and talk to us. So I think it was exactly two years after that the uh, national cashew uh, president uh, came up to me and said, oh, we've now uh, done 170,000 metric tons. Ah, I said, fantastic. Fantastic. Give me the phone. Let me call these Vietnamese people and uh, boast to him. He said, no, no, before you call him and boast to him, the same Vietnamese, they bought 160,000. <laughs> so you're back to square one. So it just shows you the possibility when you, you scale up production. So that affects all this, all this other. Of course, you know our sad story also with, uh, with tomato and I uh, won't belabor that point, but these are the category B products that are right for investment. What we are looking for is, right, for years, Nigeria has been a, quite a big recipient of FDI all over, all over the world. But the FDI that has come to Nigeria has come to the financial sector, it's come to all services. And uh, that makes it non -stick, it's a non stickly kind of investment. But what we need now is investment into manufacturing and industry. We have many of these uh, uh, plantations just ripe for investors. And uh, that is what we, we're going to be offering uh, to, the, to the chambers to help us uh, take it uh, back to Norway so we can get investment. Again, we look at it and we, we're targeting just at least 5% share of these strategic sectors over the next 10 years. And when you look at it, when you target 5% of this, we're edging close to that. 30 billion that the president is desperately looking looking for. Uh, the category B uh, products also uh, gives you that. We see where we are today, uh, and then the, the targets that we are setting uh, for us to to become big players uh, in in this. And uh, work has begun on most of the sectors. And uh, we expect zero production and export targets uh, in different waves. Some will be in zero to three years. Some will take uh, a, a bit longer uh, to get. But this is the waves we have, and this is where they fall under. So it depends on how uh, you want to invest. You can pick uh, 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 these this waves for us. We identify the top. Uh, priority export destinations for over the next five to ten years. Uh, this is not hedged in stone. It's not uh, the Quran or the Bible. Uh, we keep tricking it as we, we go along. But these are countries that have the track record and proven capacity to buy and import Nigeria's strategic and export products in large quantities. Uh, the EU, of course, is a big, a big player uh, in this for us. And uh, we now map these countries to strategic products within our zero oil plan, category A, category B. This is what these countries, this, 
is using the International Trade Center trade tools map. This is what they, 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 are, they are importing. And this is where we can uh, also uh, get, we are looking at our leather outside Europe. Uh, of course, uh, South Korea is really keen because they have reached that second uh, ball I showed in, in the uh, last a couple of slides go of now taking uh, uh, branded goods, exporting branded goods, so they leave the, the leather. So the export to Africa agenda is a bit constrained because you know uh, inter-Africa trade is one of the uh, lowest in the world. Uh, inter-Africa trade is really poor, but the African Union has set up now on how to, how we, we work towards getting uh, trade. Most trade in Africa is, is highly informal, and that's still the challenge, but there's still a market there. Uh, we had a forum with uh, uh, President Kenyatta and the former president, uh, former president of Nigeria, good luck, Jonathan. And uh, at the end of the meeting, uh, we read a communique, and uh, the communique said that Nigeria and, and uh, uh, Kenya must double trade by 2020 or something. So there was a loud applause. And after that, the President Kenyatta said, wait a minute, wait a minute, that um, let's, let's get this thing right. Uh, what is double of zero? Uh, you are not trading and you want to double zero. So that we, we, we should really look at what we were doing uh, properly. So, but we say, you know, we, no African country has yet achieved an Asian style export revolution. And that's what we're calling for. I, and I think we can really start, uh, start from Nigeria. Nigeria, and uh, that's what this world is all about. So we also set targets, like I said. Uh, this is how much output, and that's formed the basis of also uh, what we launched a couple of uh, weeks ago that was presented to the public, the Nigerian uh, Economic Recovery and Growth Plan. And the zero oil is featured prominently in this. Uh, we're setting targets and say, let's go out and produce. And so you drive the, your whole nation into pro to become a producing nation. And that's very important. Uh, we also looked at the key field to market routes. Uh, Filippo had led to that on uh, infrastructure challenges. And we say, this is what government you build. You, you don't have money, really, to build everything, or build the ones that take your goods to the market. And that's where we will we'll be looking for investment in that, uh, because you can also make uh, money of that. Uh, when you look at the blue uh, line uh, from all the way from Madiguri, uh, Madiguri to Port Accord, Calabar Port, with all the interlinkages, that's what is said, and that's what is also under the uh, Ministry of Transport. It's also in our plan, and that's, that's where we're going. The Ministry of Works, as well, has uh, leaded to this, and they all agree with it. And this is what we need to do. Key field to market routes must, must be done. Now, areas of investment, uh, national aggregators that we have of the products they have in comparative advantage in their various areas, and let's export it. We're working on one, a plantation, a, a pineapple plantation in Enugu, and we exported to Italy. Uh, yeah, yes, last a couple of last month or so, we exported to Italy uh, from Enugu, direct fresh uh, pineapples uh, to Italy. So it's it's, it's a possibility, uh, even though we had to go through Ethiopian Airways because they were the only ones flying from Enugu International Airport. So we had to fly first to Addis Ababa, and then from there to, to Italy. So you can see the export aggregators is something of real uh, importance there. Also warehousing, you know, grading, sort, sorting, and packaging. All this is, uh, is in preparation for what Filippo had said, uh, for, for us to have uh, better access really into Europe and to take goods into Europe other than oil. Uh, I'm, I'm not really afraid of uh, 
uh, European goods uh, uh, flooding our market. I know, I know they, they come as a cost, as Philippo said, they're expensive. You know, I was at a trade fair in uh, Lome years ago and surprised to see Nigerian goods competing, you know, favorably there against Chinese goods and yeah, European goods. And I, you know, had to find out in the market why. Of course, the European goods were expensive because the quality and the standards were very high. So they were, they were expensive. Now the Nigerian goods were entering the market because they were familiar. And they didn't trust the Chinese goods as being even inferior to the Nigerian goods they, they, they knew. So when you look at uh, trade, it, it's quite very complex. And uh, you, you sometimes you can't really fully just explain it, but that's the way it works. So Nigerian goods were making headway on the Nigerian Yeah, now you see, I, this computer that you have to back, <laughs> Uh, it's certainly not made in Nigeria. You, they, they were competing, and we, we, our goods were, were doing very well. So I came back, and I called my people. I said, ah, wait, this, even this EPA said that is now affecting our cocoa and affecting our this. And our goods, on the other hand, are competing and can go in. Don't we really need to you know, rethink it and work on it? And that, that's what we... We put back to the to the uh, parent ministry, and uh, we now have a, a, a trade advisor uh, working on this to to help us look look, look through it. So we're not we're not afraid of EPA. Uh, we're just being cautious. Now we say this forms this these targets will serve as a bedrock of uh, uh, the president's overall economic agenda, and we're glad that it's been accepted. We're now part of the Nigerian Economic Recovery and uh, Growth Plan. Now, we, the significant funding gaps within our export supply chain, uh, of course, what I alluded to in, in low funding for export value chain and for particular disaggregators that are ripe for investment. Um, we're looking at uh, strengthening our uh, uh, export financing uh, institutions. And uh, we're going to be introducing our incentives uh, now. We, we, we stopped our post-shipment incentive some three years ago. Uh, it wasn't unsustainable. We've reworked it now. We're introducing it, uh, I think, in the next one week or so. Uh, we're going to start giving incentives for uh, exporters again. Uh, we're also working and we reactivating our pre-shipment incentive, which is the Export Development Fund, that government is going to put money in, and we're going to be able to help SMEs, MSMEs to, to export. So all in all, it, it's looking very bright and orange for the export uh, uh, business. The key trust, of course, are export trade finance, you know, looking at recapitalization of next in the Nigerian Export Import Bank. I told you the export expansion grant is being uh, reviewed and we are launching it very soon. The export uh, development fund, it's under the National Economic and uh, Development uh, uh, Growth Plan. We need to take that seriously and we are also looking at more SME export financing that, that can be done. And mostly, like I said, the big one for us is uh, my step pro, uh, pro program, the Special Purpose Entity for Transformational Export uh, Project. This is where we're looking at private capital, uh, venture capital funds to come and help fund this, based on all those sectors uh, we have listed for you. Uh, if you're interested in petrochemicals, this is the time to come into Nigeria and set up uh, refineries, uh, be modular big refineries, this is the time, because there's money out there to be made. And I've already mentioned this. And we're working with the states also. Uh, we have what we call a one state, one program, uh, a product program. Uh, we have 36 states in Nigeria. We're saying, look, every state, give, take one product you have in comparative advantage, and let's take it for export. 
So grow productivity, uh, grow productive uh, ability amongst Nigerians in that area. You provide jobs, you, you get the land, and then we direct private and public uh, support to you. Now, the major export drivers are interested in this. We category, we have six geopolitical zones uh, consisting of many states each in them. So we categorize them. And in the Northwest, these are the major export drivers. You have cotton, leather, gold, rice, and any other export drivers under category B. Of course, you have sesame, uh, ginger spices, and, and, and tomato. So we have that all across the geopolitical zones. That's the one in the Northeast. It's again cotton, leather, soya, sugar, and the other export drivers uh, that includes cowpeas. In the North Central, it's also soya, sugar, rice, uh, shea butter, uh, cashew is bigger, uh, cement, and uh, of course oranges. Uh, in the Southwest, uh, the sad story there is, is about cocoa, but there's a potential to add to about two to uh, $2.5 billion annually uh, from cocoa and derivatives products. Uh, that is, and so we need 1.5 to 2 million hectares of land to recultivate uh, with cocoa, the associated investments in producing powder, butter, and liquor. Uh, and also the, the petrochemicals, of course, I mentioned the Adiko Dangote refiner that is coming up in Lagos. It, it started, uh, it, it started the building of that. Uh, like, but we see the region, this southwest can have at least one more uh, petrochemical plant uh, in, in that size, not to talk of the small ones. And the other export drivers in that area, of course, cement, um, ginger spices, and, and cassava. Southeast is the same, palm oil. It's another sad story uh, for us, the palm oil uh, business in, in, in Nigeria, uh, because uh, even the Malaysians needed to, when they came uh, 30 years ago, to take the palm uh, seeds uh, from a village, I think you believe it's the governor wanted to, he said he would take me, tell them to take me to go and see that uh, village that the Malaysians came to take. Uh, the palm seeds from. I said, Excellency, I'm not interested in that. You show me where you are building new plantations. And that is what I'm interested in, that I can export. I don't want to go and see where they came. I'm not on the site saying top. Mm -hmm. Where they came to take uh, palm, palm seeds some years ago. Malaysia has embarked on the entire value chain of palm. And they're making over $14 billion annually on palm. We want to go and see where they have these seeds from. So those are the potential that you have in all, all across the, uh, the, the various uh, uh, geopolitical uh, zones we have in, in, in Nigeria. And that's the one for South-South. South-South is very interesting. The same area where uh, petrochemicals are bought, the same area where you have your fertilizer, ammonia, palm oil. There is also vision there for plantain. Uh, plantain and banana, uh, it's amazing. There's a big banana plantation uh, being uh, there as well. Uh, we're trying to rescue from the various uh, uh, factions that are fighting over it. But that's also big investments that are possible in all this, all this area. We have special economic zones all across the country, and what we are doing now is we, we are trying to drive our investment, our, our, our development with industrial zones. And in the budget this year, there's about 50 billion for us to do six industrial zones uh, in, in Nigeria. It's under the Nigerian Economic uh, Recovery uh, Growth Plan. Uh, we have a provision to drive six uh, industrial uh, developments. It's just to follow what other countries, China, Vietnam, and uh, Singapore, what they have done in other, because you can't provide infrastructure and power everywhere. So just take a few ones and drive your, 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 your product, 
receive investment into those places and then drive your export uh, uh, production from, from them. Another interesting one, it fell under the radar a few times, but it's back on now. That's our staple crop processing zones, uh, which is also ripe for investment. Uh, these are where we can the warehouse and keep our uh, products and uh, we can uh, then export uh, from there. So the way forward and conclusion, key areas of support for the Zero One Plan, uh, we have the, the program framework, it's all done. I, I, like I said, it's under the, now under the Nigerian Economic Recovery and Growth Plan and uh, the sectoral activities are ongoing, uh, petrochemicals, methanol, really big. Uh, not to mention the category B products. And we're working with all the sectoral policies on this, the agricultural policy and the solid, solid minerals policy uh, as well. So they're all key in when you look at the, uh, the, growth, uh, the economic growth recovery plan. It's all uh, perfectly keyed in and uh, we're, we're set to go. Thank you very much. so much. Uh, again, that was a, an extraordinarily um, comprehensive um, uh, uh, presentation to us on, on what the government is doing uh, to boost exports in Nigeria. It's a humongous opportunity. Uh, we need to be cuter and smarter and those plans will certainly deliver a significant growth in our, in our export potential. Thank you, Shedmon. Thank you so much. Any questions for, 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 for so long? Uh, yes, there's uh, uh, the ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, initially, I, I forgot to say the obvious. I mean, how much uh, we appreciate that the Nigerian Norwegian Chamber of Commerce is uh, hosting this seminar. Uh, but it proved that the worthwhileness really is proved already by your intervention. And uh, very comprehensive and, and very impressive. I have one question, however. It might not be you to answer it. But you made a statement that the power sector is a killer to our manufacturing yeah. sector. Yeah. Uh, I don't see um, uh, any answer to that uh, challenge in your program, but uh, could you say something about uh, that? Because uh, it's a real concern uh, for, for, for your <coughs> Okay. Um, uh, all right. Okay. Um, that was a fabulous uh, presentation on the real statistics for Nigeria for the importation and exportation point of view. But uh, really, I, I just have one concern over here, like you were talking about raw materials yeah. and all the raw products, whether it's petrochemical or not. Um, fortunately, I represent uh, Gill Automations and I can really say that proudly that there is something even beyond that what Nigeria can actually work on, is a technology solutions. What I mean to say is, uh, I, I represent, our company represents brands like Siemens, Honeywell, ABB, Schneider, they are one of the renowned brands and uh, we have proudly, I mean, we are part of NEPC, we are certified by uh, your organization and we have actually sold out the entire turnkey solution package right from here and these companies, they have, you know, obliged us by accepting our process. So why not we actually even think about a technology solution even going out from Nigeria? So not just, I mean, it's good to see the uh, raw materials, but there are still things which are beyond it, so. Yeah, okay, so thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I just want to uh, have one question and um, I think your sector is doing a brilliant job. Um, and, and typically what happens in Nigeria is we have different uh, sectors doing their things. Are you coordinating this with other departments? Uh, because you know the sector of the Nigeria Economic uh, Development Plan, the uh, customs, different sectors, are they all working together to make this happen? Or we're working against each other? Take one last one. Yeah. Okay. Um, great presentation. 
the question, I, I think I think what you have outlined is a very bold plan. Yeah. It's a very bold and ambitious plan. And unless you aim that high, you're not going to get off the ground. My concern is sustainability. Okay? How do we ensure that this whole initiative doesn't lose steam or doesn't get lost in political ramblings? The next government comes in and this gets swept under the rug and, uh, and, and we're back to square one. one. One example I want to give with sustainability is that in the oil and gas sector, over the past 10 years, as a result of the uh, local content initiative, a great deal of progress has been made. A lot of investment, both local and foreign. And what has happened, we've fallen on bad times. The oil price dipped uh, our economy, which is you know, umbilically linked to the, to the oil price, went uh, down the tubes. Now, a lot of that investment is staring imminent uh, failure or, 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 or bankruptcy. I don't know what to call it. This is, this, is, this, is, this is scary for that industry. And that's why my question on, on sustainability going forward in this, in, this, in order uh, your zero oil uh, initiative. Yes. Thank you, sir. Let, let me be the bad boy here. So I, I've been around for 35 plus years in, in the country. So I can afford, I would say, uh, to say what people might not like to hear. So uh, I, I want to recall, I would say, uh, you, you said that uh, you want the export to be a vehicle for economic goals and social uh, development. Okay, that, that makes sense. But I want to recall that Nigeria today is 170, 180 million people. About at least, I would say, we expect out in Nigeria to be in 2050, 2060, the third largest population in the world. So I want to remind everybody that Nigeria is a market in itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the, the first statement I want to make. I want to recall, I would say, 30 years ago, Nigeria used to be on the verge of being an exporting country. Well, some of us will remember. We used to export fertilizer somewhere around I mean, in England, in Europe. I would say tires of, uh, were made by Michelin in Port Harcourt in those yeah. days. This factory is closed. I would even recall that Marx and Spencer were distributing Nigerian mangoes, I would say, uh, that, that long ago. So is export real the question? Or the question is, why is Nigeria not capable, I would say, having a conducive, competitive environment to make able, I would say, the local industries to develop and survive. Is that not the first question before export? Sorry, it's because I'm considering myself as a Nigerian that I can afford, I would say, asking those awful questions. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for this question. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start with the last one, uh, because that always uh, comes I'm going to start with the last one because that uh, always uh, comes up and uh, that's the argument we have against import substitution and uh, your made in Nigeria uh, uh, market and target. But let me, let me just uh, show you why trade is really your way out of, uh, to drive economic uh, development. Uh, because when you concentrate and uh, you you keep your, uh, it's just for the local market, you're not competitive anywhere in the world. And your currency, owns, you don't have foreign exchange that you need. And you are stuck in a local market where you are just, look, I always give the example uh, to people of, uh, uh, there's this meat we, we eat uh, in the northern part of the country. It's called Kilishi. It's a dried kind of meat. When you see how it's being manufactured, uh, you, you won't never move there. Uh, but because we're Nigerians, we, we just trust and love this Kilishi. And we buy it and eat it. I love it. I eat it. 
anyway, because I just trusted it. Uh, but when you, 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 you say, okay, you concentrate only on the local, local market. Uh, and what, what have you had? That's why many of your industries have just collapsed. Because you, you limited it on that local market. But when you're competitive, when you, you, your market, your goods are also being sold out, and one, you make foreign exchange, you raise the level and value of your goods. Uh, and because it's a matter of choice. I can always, you, you can always buy what you want from uh, elsewhere in the world. I use the example of England. England is an island on water. And the number one exporting thing England does, uh, imports from France, is Perry water and Evian water. They don't say, oh, okay, yeah, we're on water, we have a market because it's water, so we're going to ban Perry water and Evian water. But no, they're okay with it because they are also exporting other things uh, out to, to, to the world. You have all that, uh, 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 you, you talked about uh, the industries we had. We had so much more industry. The textile firms, everything. But they were not competitive. Because when you want to close the market that, oh, you can just keep supplying locally, that's what causes a problem for you. And when you look at that chart, and you look at the, the countries that are exporting, that are wealthy than other nations, China also has a population of, of one point something billion people. Uh, they can say, no, we're just going to be feeding and, and supplying to the Chinese. And where's the revenue for the Chinese to buy those goods? Where's the revenue for the Nigerians to buy these products you want to export and make foreign exchange? Are you following me? So that, that's, that's really the key. So your industry, your manufacturing, your industry must be export oriented. That's the only way they can survive in this global world because everybody has a choice. So that's, that's very, very important uh, to note. Uh, that's why I always, you know, this uh, uh, import substitution, once we start, uh, we feed, uh, we're okay. We are not okay. We've been taking rice, we're doing rice now, uh, rice from Lagos. Uh, from Kebi uh, to Lagos, that uh, uh, partnership. And the rice, who is buying the rice here in, in, in Lagos? Do, do you understand? Where do you be? Uh, 180 million people. No, who are the people that can buy the rice? Out of that 180, uh, I can tell you that 80% of them want it free. So, where's your market? So you have to think, like, let me get my rice ready so I can export it and go and tap into that market that is $25 billion globally, annually, selling. Then I can, I can make money for the industry. That's on, on, on power, uh, Ambassador, yes. Uh, I had to really shorten my, my slides. If I'm going into this, Filippo knows my zero oil plan is like two hours when I start taking it product by product, sector by sector. So I had to really try and compress it and say what is, uh, what I can target to uh, the Netherlands. And uh, Ambassador, I'm really eyeing your sovereign wealth fund. Yeah. I'm looking at it. <laughs> so, uh, Excellency, there's, there's work being done, you know, and that is also another area right for investment. The, the power sector. Uh, we have the Power Africa program uh, going on. The EU also, as, as Filippo said, you know, uh, do the investments to support that. Because we know we really have to industrialize. We really have to, you know, to, 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 to have power in order to do everything. So we know that. On, on uh, IT, uh, again, compressed program. But what we're working on, also on the NEPC, is what we call our export of services. Uh, and we're looking at ICT really uh, big there. We're presently fine-tuning the strategy with the Commonwealth Secretariat in, in London, in the UK. 
were presently continuing. So that's why it's not in the slide. The Minister of uh, ICT uh, Communications has also uh, uh, made uh, decisions to me that I'm not talking about that. Oh yes, export of services, a big trillion uh, dollar industry. You, we need to get into that as well. So we're working on it. That's why it's not, it's not part of this plan. On they are learning to create jobs and then the, the need for also continuity. Yes, when I placed on the chat, like we, like uh, the chairman of the chamber said, it's a bold and ambitious plan. But when do you get bold and ambitious? This is the time to be bold and ambitious. This is the time to set targets, uh, to dream high, then you can achieve something. So when we look at it and we compare the economies and we compare the population, and so what China did, moving 600 million people out of poverty uh, and the jobs they created. And we say, yes, it's possible for Nigeria as well to do this and create, uh, 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 target 500,000 jobs annually. We must try and create these jobs. The NBS tells us, Nigerian Bureau of Statistics, that we will need for the economy and the nation to be at peace, we need to create over 3 million jobs every year based on what we're reading out uh, from universities and uh, uh, from NYSC. It, it's really scary. So you need to, and we say agriculture is really the key, it's a way to go for this. But if they're not making money from the agriculture and they're just feeding people that cannot afford rice, uh, then we are back to square one. And on the, the various sectors coming together, that's why it's now in the economic recovery and growth plan. Uh, because it's all these sectoral policies. And uh, for, uh, it was very good for because this government uh, really set up and said, look, what has the other government, the previous government been doing? What is good about it? The ones are good, we're going to continue. So all, many of these sectoral policies are being continued. Now you can find tweaking, but I, 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 like I say, a plan can, should not be hedged in stone, you know, permanently. It's, it's not a Quran, it's not a Bible. You keep tweaking it as the need goes and uh, what you need out of it. And so that's what is being done. The Nigeria Industrial Revolution Plan was not conceived by this government. It was by the last government. This government is continuing with it. Uh, also the agriculture, uh, transformation policy has been retweeted, just modernized a bit, and uh, uh, it's been continued by this government. So I think sensible uh, 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 people really will know you must continue this. And there's a big, what is also good about this, many of these sectoral plans, is that the private sector is totally involved in this. Uh, the NESG played a big role in shaping Nigerian economic growth recovery plan and with various stakeholders uh, formation like this. And that is what is going to drive it. Uh, because they will tell the next government that this is the plan. This is what we are doing. This kind of investment that are coming in. We know uh, there's a lot of fright about non-continuity of government programs. That you start off something and uh, the next person abandons it and tries uh, uh, something. When I came into the NEPC, it's interesting, I came ooh, ooh, I'm from private sector, I'm going to drive that, I'm going to drive that. So, I, the, I'll share this with you. The uh, former president of the uh, uh, Nigerian uh, Manufacturing Association now called me and said, look, I, I said, this is what I'm doing. This was, eh, 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 she said, wait, wait, wait. Look, there have been things you know, studies commissioned, things done in the NEPC. Go and dust them up, bring them up, and continue with them. I said, but I didn't read that in the handover note. Is that what handover note? Forget that. Go and ask a few of them, the uh, directors there, that what did you do on this? What did you do on this? So I went round and I called one of two of them. Ah, by the way, what have you done? And they started bringing these programs for me. So it's all that that we use to formulate the zero hour plan. 
Because things have already been done. So I just went back to it and took it and, and started flying, flying with it and preparing for when we were going to be called to do this. So I think that is very uh, important. But there is a very good uh, sectorial um, uh, intervention uh, that is happening uh, now. The synergy is very great. Uh, the ministers are not working in silos anymore. Also, I must also mention on that, on the Presidential Council on the Ease of Doing Business, uh, which is chaired by the Vice President. Uh, indeed, we tried it in the last administration, and uh, each minister was trying to do it. But when you find out that, uh, for instance, we, uh, in the Ministry of uh, Trade, Industry, and Development, we don't control the customs. Uh, we don't control uh, 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 NAMDAC, that's under health, you know, only standards organization is with us. And so you can't do all these things. So there's now a presidential uh, council on the ease of doing business that's going to take all this together. And it's chaired by the vice president. And they meet every month. Uh, we meet every month. Everybody, every stakeholder is involved in this. And we're going to drive it. Because we have a target. We want to go down the ranking. Uh, go up, sorry. I'm sorry, we don't want to go down. <laughs> I want to climb up the, the rankings. Uh, we've set a target for ourselves and it must be met. So everybody is being ticked upon on what you're supposed to do every month when we go for this meeting. So if you fall short, then you you run into a problem and government changes you and bring it and bring somebody else. After all, there are 170 million Nigerians. You can all be the ones that can. So that is, that is also happening. Uh, for sustainability and continuity, also in the Zero Plan, there is, and also the Nigerian Economic Recovery Plan, uh, Growth Plan, there is the measuring and evaluation aspect of it. I removed it for purpose of time for this presentation. So there is a monitoring and evaluation uh, that is going across, you know, uh, that comes with this. And that's how you measure and evaluate where you are what you've met, the products you've sold, the countries you've sold it to, how much they did, how many SMEs exported, uh, etc., as opposed to big companies. So we are going to monitor and evaluate it all through. And that's, uh, I feel, uh, that's the way to, to measure that. Uh, sustainability and continuity, uh, well, like I said, when the private sector is more involved in your economic plan, then it stands chance of success. Uh, because when a new government comes, the private sector is the same. They are going to be there and they are going to say, no, these are the policies we fought for. This is what is working. And I think that's really the way to, to carry it along. I hope I've answered these questions. Thank you very much. Next, uh, a case study by a uh, first class company, FoodPro, in the export uh, sector. Um, it, it's, it, I think it's a great and, and great presentation, uh, followed by a presentation by the Bank of Industry on, on uh, financing of, uh, of export related businesses. Yeah. I know we've been, we've, been, uh, we've been sat now for about an hour and a half, and I'm, I'm quite, quite certain that uh, a 10 minute uh, convenience break might not be a bad idea. So, uh, shall we do that? Uh, ten minutes, please, gentlemen, yeah. ladies. the Chief Executive Officer of a, a great company called FoodPro, um, who, has, uh, who has very, very kindly uh, uh, offered to give uh, 
a case study really about his business, the challenges he faces and the opportunities that, uh, that he sees ahead. So uh, without much ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ayo Olajika, who is the CEO of Food Pro Limited. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think I've, I've budgeted here about 30 minutes, but I think I'll probably do it faster because. I'm now standing before the guy who's standing between you and lunch, so I can, I can see him staring at me, you know, saying, listen, hurry on. Okay, so what I'll try to do is just uh, talk a little bit about FootPro, who we are, what we do, and then, you know, I, I've got one slide where I talk about the, the challenges and also, I mean, how we've addressed it. Uh, so FootPro, we are a cashew processing company, and we... Uh, we process both for domestic consumption and we also export. So, but the bulk of our, I mean, our business, 90, 95% of it is mostly exports. But we, we launched a retail product uh, last year and it's, so far it's been encouraging, but I mean, uh, compared to the, to the opportunity outside Nigeria, you know, it's, uh, I think it's small and it will continue to remain small relative to our export business as we grow it. Um, our factory is based in Ilori, in, in Kwara State. Um, I think you, you're buying it, right? <laughs> yeah. There you go. And then, like I said, you know, we've got both exports and uh, branded products. We, our factory is the only African Cashew Alliance uh, certified, quality certified uh, company. And you know, I say that because a lot of the a lot of the companies that are you know doing cashews in Nigeria actually don't have that certification, and that certification talks about all the you know the uh, food safety stuff and the quality stuff. So if you eat cashews in Nigeria, you know, um, I mean, I don't, I can't speak for the imported ones, but I'm sure they don't have it either. But if you eat cashews in Nigeria and you're not having the lion cashews or the food pro stuff, you, you have to stop it because the guys who are the guys who are selling you cashews. Uh, it's from factories that are not certified, and you shouldn't eat something that's not certified. You know. And obviously, I mean, uh, you know, we are currently expanding the business. Uh, we are growing our capacity about 3x. Uh, we export products to the to the US. We send products to the UK, and we also do Vietnam and occasionally India. Okay. So very quickly, cashews, uh, unlike almonds. So you know, I mean, you can read up on almonds, but in cashews, the, the growers of almonds are very rich. The growers of cashews are poor because it's the reverse. If you look at the almonds equation, all the, the almond farmers control most of the value. If you look at cashews, the retailers, you know, uh, the crafts of the world or the Walmarts control the value. In cashews, 51% of cashews are grown in Africa. West Africa represents the bulk of it. <laughs> Um, the bulk of that cashew then that's grown in Africa is then processed to the first stage in Asia, in both India and Vietnam, Vietnam being the largest processor in terms of exports. And then they're roasted uh, mostly in the West, uh, you know, the US, North America, Europe, uh, and then India. India is a big market for cashews, but India net net, India is not a, it's not that they're not relevant, but globally they, because they, they consume so the Indian producer of cashews does not want to export because he will get more money in India than he will get if he sends it to anywhere, anywhere else in the world. So they don't like to export, so they, they, they're a non-player globally, except for where you're competing for raw materials, whereas Vietnam is they're the largest. So Vietnam last year, I think they did about $4 billion worth of cashews. In Vietnam has got 2 million tons, metric tons annual capacity or in terms of processing. They produce, they only grow about 0 0.4 million tons. They import the bulk of Africa's 1 point something million tons. And so what I say to people is that Vietnam, that equation is ready for disruption. Because those factories in Vietnam, it just when Africa getting its act right, become you know, uh, redundant. And I'm not suggesting that we should render factories in Vietnam redundant, I'm just saying Maybe Africa should build its own factories. 
in terms of the value chain, we, uh, as a business, we play, uh, apart from farming, we play across the entire value chain. We process in the first stage, we trade the cashews, we, um, we do wholesale processing, and we also do uh, retail processing. Um, and in time, we would also uh, you know, put up uh, plantations. Right now, the, what I was saying at the beginning, if you can see, if you look at the, you know, the profit pool or the value pool in cashews, you can see that the bulk of it starts from when you start to process. Everything else before that, it's, you know, it's very minute. So it's just people taking 20% here, 15% here, but not really adding you know, any value to the produce. For instance, if you take, let's take 3,000 tons of cashews, if I'm going to trade that, I need, um, I need three guys and then a lot of casual labor. I need them for about two, two months to, you know, to gather this produce, get it out of the country, and then those guys, you know, I mean, for all I care, they can go do whatever they want to do. If you want to process the same amount of cashews, you're looking at buying anything between 200 to 300 sustainable jobs. And in cashews, because they, the nuts is very delicate, cashews, we prefer to hire women. So we have about, I think it's about 90 to, nine, between 5 to 90% of our staff are female. And then I read somewhere that, you know, if you are giving, if you're giving money to women, you're doing more, more good to the world than if you give it to men. Except for me, of course. <laughs> then, I mean, uh, you know, I was asked to uh, to talk about the financing bit, but a, a an export business, you there are three broad issues that you face. Uh, one is, you know, there's a commercial bit of it, which is you know getting access to markets, you know, pricing all kinds of stuff. Regulatory is very big in our lives, and that's both domestic and the you know and the destination market, and then obviously. Uh, the financial financial wow. challenges of a, of an export business. So from our, from our perspective, we think when we think about you know financial challenges or opportunities, we think about it. At least I think about it in you know in three buckets. I mean the first one, which is very big for us, is currency. And any any export business anywhere in the world, you're always your your operating currency is different from your revenue currency. And so we are always, so you're always trying to figure out, first of all, which currency do you borrow in? Do you borrow in your operating currency or do you borrow in your, in your revenue currency? And obviously for us, we, we, um, we opted for, you know, for dollars, not because dollars is better than Naira, but just because in this market, there are no instruments whatsoever to, you know, to manage that currency risk. So then the question becomes, which currency do you, a, are you comfortable in, in terms of uh, you know managing that risk? More importantly, is for us if you are trying to grow your business, you've got to figure out where there's liquidity in terms of currency. So, for instance, you know, I mean, there are a lot of Nigerian banks who tell me they support exports and they do all this stuff. But a an average cashew factory, if you if you want to be uh, a sizable cashew factory, minimum kind of working capital you need is about five million dollars. And they are five million dollars, ten million dollars, because the, the product is seasonal, so you got to store it. And if you're storing products, you, I mean, you got to find you got to finance it. The average Nigerian bank probably, can, you know, if you're lucky, they can give you hundred million naira, two hundred million naira, depending on what exchange rate you're using. I mean, I do hear that the exchange rate is converging, but depending on which rate you're using, that could be anything between three hundred thousand dollars to uh, just below a million dollars. So we very quickly realized that we needed to, you know, we needed to go offshore in terms of looking for funding. And when you're trying to go offshore looking for funding, then obviously the offshore, the lender is saying, well, where's the revenue coming from? So you've got to go and secure these offtakes. In trying to secure an offtake from, uh, from a buyer, you've got to show capacity. To show capacity, you've got to have money to build a factory. You can kind of see how these things go in a circle. So, so somehow, unless you have you know, a rich uncle somewhere who can back you, uh, you hoped for what we did. We've got, you know, a very solid shareholding base who, you know, made up of, you know, ex-bankers and businessmen who who backed the business to put, you know, to put the capacity we have in place. We've got strong support from the bank of industry as well. And obviously, I mean, you know, in case you haven't noticed, um, the NEPC has got a soft spot for, for our company. I'm not saying he didn't mention that in the presentation, but... <laughs> You know, we've, we've got very, very excellent support from the Nigerian Export Promotion Council. 
And so that, that has helped us a lot in, in that currency bucket, because what it's done is that we were able to put the capacity in place, which allowed us to then secure the offtakes that we need from both the US and in Vietnam as well, which then allowed us to secure the funding that we needed. So at this point in time, Naira funding is very, you know, it's very, it's not large in, in the business, but it's, you know, it would have been nice if we had some, you know, size of Naira, but given what has been happening in the last two months, you know, having Naira may not necessarily be, have been a good thing. The second part of it is, you know, it's, it's uh, collateral, because um, obviously now that we've gone offshore, the collateral bit of it is slowly falling away because we are, we now have partners who understand commodity commodity based lending. So you know, I don't have to now own a house in in Banana Island. Not that I had one before, but I mean now I don't need it. You know, and you know so so that collateral bit as an export business, if you don't have it, it's is a is a significant challenge because, for instance, if you want to deal with craft, craft will say to you. You need to be about a 10,000 metric tons factory. 10,000 metric tons is roughly between 10 to 12 million dollars worth of um, work, uh, raw cash. Use, right? 10 to 12 million dollars, that's the kind of collateral you have to, if you're borrowing locally, that's the kind of collateral you have to give a local bank. But if you're lucky to get offshore, then you know, such, such demands don't exist. And then the final bit is. Um, is cash flow because it's an export business. Obviously, all that you earn is very lumpy, so it's you earn it by containers. And so, you, again, you need to to have a partnership with a financial institution that understands that, not and that can tailor the lending, structure it to what you're trying to what you're trying to achieve. Again, I mean, all this, I mean, it's work in progress, but we have made a lot of progress in trying in terms of trying to address, you know, these three challenges. I think. You know, uh, a lot of what uh, most of those businesses will face these challenges. And if these challenges are not, if you're not addressing them in a very intelligent way, then it slows down that growth that you're trying to achieve. And then, you know, I mean, the message for the likes of, you know, the BOI, the next teams of in Nigeria is, you know, as a development bank, when you have that condition in there that says you need the security from a commercial bank, you cease to be a development bank. You're just a bank who has liquidity relying on a commercial bank, masquerading as a development bank. <laughs> so if you need me to break that down, I can do that. <laughs> you know, I can do that a lot. Um, and then obviously the you know the fourth thing that we focus on in the business is is community community impact, uh, because we the areas where we operate, we're always interested in how the society or the community around us is doing. Uh, and I've now, I've discovered that, you know, focusing on community impact, especially if you're playing globally, is also a very good business. I mean, there's all kinds of people who give you money now just because you are a nice person. Um, this just shows that economics I was talking about earlier. If you look at the value of the raw product, it's about $1,300 per ton. By the time you process it, you go to $6,000. If you look at the jobs, uh, you know, in, do you, are you creating the jobs in Nigeria or are you doing it in Vietnam? And obviously, uh, I, I'm not saying that uh, the 500,000 uh, 500, jobs, I'm not saying it's coming from here, but you know, <laughs> when we run the numbers, that's, that's the potential impact that you're looking at. And, and in concluding, it's this, this is just pictures of you know us training farmers. So we give we train farmers for free on quality, and also value creation for them. And obviously, I mean, uh, when we train these farmers, even though it's free, we benefit because when they give us good cashews, we get good output. So it's it looks free, but it's not necessarily free. Thank you. That was my last slide. Like, thank you. Like, I'm done. <laughs> if you have questions or <laughs> any questions? Oh, okay. uh, 
it's quite brave uh, of working through uh, the temperature in the room. I do apologize that it appears to be a bit of a challenge with, uh, with the air conditioning system, um, which uh, is a disaster um, in the tropics. Uh, but uh, we're trying to arrange for some fans to be brought in uh, while the technical work goes on. So I do apologize for that and uh, thank you for your bravery. Um, there seems to be a bit of a thread that has been going through uh, the presentations here. Um, the issue of exports and local consumption. Uh, my fellow citizen, my French Nigerian citizen who has been here for 30 years, raised that point. Um, I don't think it's mutually exclusive. for export. But the question, which is taking some time to come out here, is that um, is access. You mentioned the issue of funding. Uh, Filippo, who was here earlier, spoke about some grants which the EPA, uh, those agreements were put in place for people like you. I'm glad you also mentioned the Bank of Industry. Um, looking for innovative ways to finance production in Nigeria is critical to businesses like yours. Um, have you sought uh, those types of uh, um, financing from either the European Union or some other agencies that are interested and are committed to development uh, in Africa? How successful have you been at that? Have you tried that? Okay, I mean, we. Um, I, I, so, first of all, I think we've tried some, but I don't think we've tried at the level at which we we could have tried. And, and I think, uh, first of all, I'm guilty of that because I've come from an investment banking background. We, you know, the idea is to first let's establish a business that works on its own steam. Mm -hmm. And then whatever, you know, support we can get from the EU, the World Bank, then becomes an upside to the shareholders. Because mm -hmm. I don't think I can really go to my shareholders and tell them, listen, our business case depends mm -hmm. on, yeah. on all these nice yeah, things. So we, so we, so we, are, we, I mean, for instance, we work with the USA, you know, but again, it's things that are not crucial or urgent because they do take time to get anything approved. I mean, so, so that, that is a problem. But I mean, again, we, our view is that, look, this pool of money that exists, you can access them, but they can't be, you know, critical, they can't be on a critical path because if they are, then I mean, Take for instance the EPA, they, they hasn't been signed. So, mm, yeah. yeah. So, but I mean, we love, you know, the development players in the room, we love them and we yeah. like to uh, we like to work with them, but uh, they do they do take time. Yes. Excellent presentation. Uh, just a quick uh, look at the value chain. Is there any move? considered kind of uh, aggregating your efforts in terms of processing. Just I can imagine uh, right across the Kashu Belt, which is all the way from the west to the east, that potentially you can synergize to create and break, do that, accelerate that disruption uh, by being a market leader uh, in, in, in trying to achieve that. Only thing that that is something that is begging for, for you to take that step. Yeah, well, I don't know if the Vietnamese are in the room, so I'm, I'm <laughs> I mean, the, the reality is that, you know, it takes, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of capital required for that disruption. And I don't, I don't mean just financial capital, because I think that would be easiest. It's actually, there's a lot to be said for, for the skills and the technology required. And there's a lot of improvement that's happening in cash in terms of technology. And that technology is pushing you know, the, this disruption is moving the date forward and it's, I, I think it's going to, uh, we're talking a couple of years. I mean, obviously, uh, there's something to be said for the operating environment from a regulatory perspective because that can put a break, can, that can pull the brakes on, on everything. But in terms of how quickly would it happen, let's just say we are seeing interest from, from Europeans who want to come and process in Africa. You know, so, so that thing is, is going to happen faster than people think. You know, but we don't know exactly when. I already, I'm already aware that the, the Vietnamese have started limiting the kind of technology they send down this way, and you can you can imagine why. It will happen, and obviously, you know, I mean, we, we will 
try to be, uh, we try to be to be market leaders in, in that. But you know, my mandate from my shareholders is not destruction; it's value creation. Great. Uh, any any further questions for Ayo? Difficult situation. Uh, you also didn't take the opportunity to talk about how much processing and uh, the retail line. Uh, I think somebody talked about also feeding the Nigerian population. Uh, to tell them how many flavors you have at the stores and they can find your products. And I suggest the next time you have an opportunity, maybe it's a good idea to show people what the product looks like, the packaging and where they can uh, find yeah, the yeah. products. Um, uh, I'm sorry if I go into so much details because I'm the chairman of Food Pro. I was, <laughs> going to, I was going to say you sound like an investor. <laughs> I was going to say you sound like an investor. <laughs> you sound like an investor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think they need to know where to find the products, they need to know the flavors, they need to know why they should actually eat more cashew nuts. Because yeah. I hear you live five years or ten years Longer. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was uh, going to take uh, Ayo up on that. Uh, I'm not a shareholder. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, the NEPC what, uh, has accused me of having a, a, a preference for this uh, Ion Cashew by Food Pro. Uh, I am taking it almost everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere. Uh, from the president uh, to state governors, uh, and then out of the country as well, I, I, I take it. I'm surprised that I didn't come with food pro cash here to distribute. I, I do that. I do that even at our meetings. Uh, because, uh, but on the Nigerian market and the uh, foreign market, uh, what, what you will understand about cashew, which is also to answer uh, your, the former question you asked, uh, support I on this, is, look, we don't even know the benefits of cashew yet. Uh, cashew is not strong in, in, in Africa. Yeah, in, in Africa, it's not strong in Africa. So that's why most of it is geared toward exports. We pushed Food Pro more uh, because we encourage them first get into processing. Uh, that's important for us. We can have a, a flagship uh, company we can use to demonstrate that processing is indeed possible in Nigeria and they can export. But then they now start to penetrate the local market. Nigeria, we are more in touch with uh, granots. You know, on every meeting you go, on every table, is granots and tom tom that you will, you will find on the table. Uh, because we don't really know the benefits and the health situation of cash. So to get into that market alone, it's challenging to say the least. Uh, but when people see a good product, they are reacting to it. But while we're pushing more on exports for that, because we know there's a market out there, then when we can show the one that is processed in, in Nigeria that can challenge the ones that are processed in Vietnam and other parts, then that is the the plus, and that's what we are pushing uh, Food Pro for. I know maybe because I was there, Mr. Chairman, he didn't want to talk of the challenges on uh, the banks, and uh, good Nexim, BOI, etc., etc. But we were, he knows we were facing them head on, even with NAPDAC, uh, you know, to make sure everything is, is okay. And with this synergy, in the ease of doing business, we're able to call them and tell them what uh, hasn't been done. And I think that is where. But the most important thing, please, you need to have, uh, applaud Food Pro for what they've been able to do. And I like the business side of it. They are not relying on grants, on, uh, on whether we sign the EPA or whether we don't sign, or what Filippo is going to 
how much dollars, euros, Filippo is going to bring into the business, or DFIT. You know, it's just a business plan that must succeed and can work. And that's the environment where we see the whole country. So thank you very much, uh, Fruitbro. Mill Scooter, my request for sponsorship is coming. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Femi Shitu, who is here and will we'll talk to us about uh, the bank and uh, how the bank approaches supporting businesses. So it uh, should be interesting. Thank you. Uh, Ed will talk me about that. I'm going to have a customer of mine talking for me. Uh, I said, hmm, two things can happen. He said, I'm going to go south or north. Um, <laughs> even when the chairman was saying that when I was a bit uh, lenient on us, I said, well, what I did was that before I made this presentation, I introduced myself so that I could actually see my eyes from where I was standing from. <laughs> yeah, so um, basically, I think um, at the end of my presentation, I'm going to try and maybe uh, put our own uh, perspective as for this issue of uh, collateral. Uh, but I'll just uh, run through this uh, because, like I said, I'm the guy between you and lunch. So, but it's not, it's just about each slide, but I'll try and uh, uh, make it uh, as uh, fast as possible without losing the quality. Um, the outline is, um, I'm actually going to talk about our mandates, our efforts, the opportunities uh, for export-oriented uh, companies, and then what we do, and then I'll show uh, like a graphical representation of where, how we are financed, and then what we look for. Uh, in terms of introduction, I think this has been uh, dealt with uh, from uh, previous speakers. Uh, we all know that Nigeria is blessed uh, human and natural resources, and it's a market that definitely cannot be actually ignored. Uh, for BOI, the mandate is actually that we are supposed to help and assist and provide financial assistance for establishment of the large, small, and medium scale enterprises. Um, we are supposed to do that, we, we help in modernizing existing uh, factories and we also rehabilitate. Uh, it was conceived as a catalyst in transforming a uh, real and emerging sector. Uh, BOI is uh, predominantly a development finance institution, so it is uh, largely owned by the government of uh, Nigeria. Uh, so what we normally do is this, is that, because being the DFI, we knew at the very beginning that we are not going to actually survive or be sustainable if we have to wait for government subventions. So what we need is that the bank in its own decided that, look, if you want to attract other sources of funding in which you can only, there are certain things that you might need to do. And one of those things is that the bank actually, the management decided that it has to be rated. So based on our operations, we opened our books and we got ratings from Augusto and Gold, this is local. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of Fitch and Moody's and also the International Standard Organization, uh, the Quality Management Service. We have over 2008 and presently now in the process of getting more in 2015. This was actually done so that we can actually come up with, if the bank wants to actually go out there and get funds for us to be able to use to only. So this is one of the things that we are doing there to actually do this. And then based on this, we'll be talking with a whole lot of DFIs around the world, uh, the likes of BNDS, uh, African Development Bank, FMO, China, just to mention a few. So we've had discussions with them, to meet with them to say, look, if based on what we are doing, if we can get cheaper source of funds, we can also use it and lend to Nigerians, either for local production and also for export. And so based on this, we were able to actually get one of this uh, from the African Development Bank, a 100 million uh, uh, facility, line of credit, for companies that are actually export oriented. Um, this is basically for, it was done in such a way to conceive that for countries that have dollar revenues, they can actually assess this and because it's repayment to be in dollars. This is part of the way in which the bank of industry is trying to think outside the box to actually help and assist export-oriented uh, companies. So basically it's long tenured and it's targeted at export-oriented uh, uh, dollar revenue companies and interest is about 6.5. 
Um, we also have the narrow aspect of it, which is also long term. BOI does a whole lot of long term funding, and this is how we use to assist and help both local and those that are there for export. Now, what do we do? Basically, what, majorly what we do is we do equipment financing. That is, we buy plants and machineries for manufacturing firms that would like to operate whether locally or even internationally. So we do that, and then over the course of the time, we find out that okay, people said, okay, you bought the items of plants and machinery. So how are we going to go? I don't have work capital. So the bank itself also has moved ahead, and then we now have offer structured working capital, both for existing and for potential to assist. This is actually targeted towards purchase of raw materials. And like I said earlier, long-term loans, and another aspect of it is capacity development. We found over time that we really need to train and retrain, even for people that are not going to come into the bank to actually assess loans. They would need to actually be trained. So the bank is involved in a whole lot of trainings. For instance, presently now, we are doing some trainings for gemstones. These are being done for a whole lot of youths. It's happening in Gobi right now. So that we can actually train people to, to do certain value addition kind of businesses that they can use even to export or even for, uh, for local uh, sales. And one of the things that we do is that as a bank, we have found out that even when we actually support our customers, they are coming from the point of fact that BOI is a development finance institution and it's owned by the federal government. So there are certain times they are faced with challenges. So BOI also puts it upon itself to assist in that area by playing advocacy role. We have actually have, we have uh, relationships with NEPC, SON, NAVDAC, the customs, and even various chambers of commerce so that we can actually help. If you have an issue with NAVDAC, for instance, if you are here and you have given you a loan, we can actually be a way to actually get you to resolve it, even with some, and even with tribe also with the customs. And so, generally, our loan portfolio, as of February, we have um, agro processing, we also deal in the creative industry in terms of the knowledge form. And this is also one area that uh, is being exported out of this country. Um, engineering and technology. That involves engineering, construction, ICT, even uh, aviation and power. The bank also is one that actually manages funds for the government. So presently, we manage the CBN Intervention Fund for Power and Aviation Fund. This we are doing in conjunction with AFC. So some of the loans are there. Uh, food processing, gas and petrochemicals. We also have a bias for gender businesses. That's we finance women in actually in any business. And then we also, based on the power situation, we have a solar energy app in which we are doing constructing some small or minimal uh, power solar panel, uh, panels for, uh, for industrialists. Uh, presently now we have about a 50 million uh, limit for small SMEs that will need solar panels to be able to actually go ahead with their, with their businesses. And also solar users, like I mentioned before. So, what, are, what do we look out for and what are priorities? We look for projects with uh, value addition, especially ones that utilize our modern natural resources. Uh, projects that will impact positively forex savings, employment generations. Whenever we have projects, we also make sure that whatever projects we are bringing for us must have identifiable economic impact. So we like supporting such projects. Also projects with high propensity for technology transfer. We believe that the next level has to be with disruption with technology. So we are also open to technology projects. And then we have projects that have economic linkages with MSMEs. It is always uh, our desire that you can actually get a project, in which case you can mention one, two, three SMEs that will actually have products that might be supplying. When you actually approach your service, say, okay, fine, this is what you want to do. What are, who are the SMEs that are supplying you? Well, we get an idea of who they are, and we find out that what are the issues with those SMEs that are even supplying you, so that we can even go there and even assist those SMEs to actually upgrade them to supply you more. So that's what I'm saying in terms of uh, off-take projects. And then we have a preference for only own Nigerian companies. We do finance for our own companies as well, and we do finance those uh, involved in partnership. But more often than not, we also say, Please, we would like Nigerians to be at the forefront 
of developing this economy. So, uh, before that, I just wanted to say that in terms of when it comes to the issue of collateral, yes, over time this has been a very touchy and naughty, uh, naughty issues uh, for for the bank in terms of what we say. How are you going to collateralize this? Now, um, one thing I would like to explain is that over time, we are not resting on our cores just when it comes to this issue of collateral. We keep thinking and we keep learning. When you hear uh, when customers are complaining, I think the best bet for you is just to go back and you think about it on how you're going to go about it. In terms of collateral, we are actually in a very peculiar uh, situation. We've done over time. We've gone as far as the micro level to actually give loans to artisans even without collateral. And uh, you'll be surprised that we have learned from that because we got bonds there as well. Because uh, one of the key things when it comes to you lending is that the character issue must be put in place. But what we have done so far is that we are looking at other areas. Presently, we have the credit bureaus now. What does that mean is that everybody is supposed to have a credit history. Once you have a credit history, it makes it better if your credit history has been good in terms of repaying loans. We believe that as this goes on and this uh, record keeping keeps keeping on, we believe that at a particular point in time, this issue of collateralization will actually be minimal. There's also the issue of the collateral registry also being mooted. So we believe that things are actually being done. But it's not just that the bank is uh, just sitting there and saying we will not actually assist. But we try as much as possible to impact the economy and by actually providing access to funding. Thank you. For me, thank you so much for that. Uh, that was very, very useful, very valuable as well. Um, I, I think it's uh, um, certainly a resource which is a learning resource as well. We, we in the private sector need to feed back uh, to the bank of industry um, in terms of its thinking and its reorganization and its restructuring and its uh, new initiatives. Um, uh, one of the things I hear that, that's quite frustrating for me uh, here in Nigeria is, well, it, it's just Nigeria. I don't, I've never understood that and I don't understand that and I don't think I ever will because we won't change anything if we're just Nigeria forever. So um, feedback is highly important. Um, please make contact with Femi um, and, uh, and feedback uh, as, as required to the Bank of Industry. Any questions for, for the bank? Be by uh, what we, because we found out over time that we actually support businesses in which case it just imposes that the suppliers will normally come and then they will train. So we actually said, Look, we would like it if you are doing projects in which you can actually teach Nigerians to get to that level. Now, uh, I can, I was saying when the, uh, somebody was mentioning about some of the projects that we've done. Um, we have a company in uh, Port Harcourt. So what they are trying to do is, uh, ABD actually does a whole lot of distributions of uh, uh, these sockets. But this company now is actually trying to do it here in Nigeria. So by actually doing the assembly, first and foremost, I think there's a learning phase. We, we learn how to assemble it and whatever before going to the production stage. So such kind of companies, these are the ones that I said I have proposed to transfer that knowledge. So those are the kind of things that, that I hear my dad talk about. The question I have is really, through your presentation, you talked quite a bit about assistance, uh, assisting uh, local industry to access funds. Uh, but it, it sounded a little passive to me, rather than a situation where the bank actually has a vision uh, and actually actively goes out there to create an enabling environment for people to access the fund to be able to do the projects they want to do. It, it looks more like 
okay, we're there to just assist. And I, I, I don't know what, whether I'm getting a wrong impression of that actually. No, I can explain that. Uh, when, when I was talking about the issue of the capacity development, sir, what I meant is that we found out over time that even a whole lot of people approach the bank without having, you know, a concept of actually lending money or in terms of how they will go about it. Um, I put the website there because, you know, we are, we are limited. Some of the things that we've done, apart from capacity development, is that we have what we call SME consultants. Because the issue of people being able to come forward and bring back people projects to us is an issue because of documentation and all that. So we sat down with consultants and we said, look, and people are always complaining that if you go and meet them one-on-one, -on -one, the issue of the money will skyrocket. So people are always agreement to them to limit their charging fees and telling them that, look, one of the things you are supposed to do is first and foremost go out there and look for viable projects to package it so that the processing time is highly reduced. So by so doing, we are making sure that we are going out there to assist, not just sitting back and waiting for them to come. Another thing is that uh, one of the issues we always have is that people have been saying that BOI has been a bit regional. We, we are not found anywhere, we are not close to the customers. The management has had that also. And based on that, we are also moving up. Unlike, uh, I think, uh, three, four years ago, we just had about seven uh, offices. But as I speak to you now, we have about 22. And this is going on. So what we are trying to do is to make sure that we get close to the people we are supposed to be financing, hear them and get feedback, and then improve on them. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, I have one question. Uh, firstly, it's a great presentation. And You've replicated about uh, BOI very well over here. But uh, in terms of industries, I'll just uh, hammer the nail on the head. Like, most important thing is availability of forex. How do you deal with it? Of course, we all are working in Nigeria right? and we all know about it. So, what special or what different steps BOI is taking? to boom the local industries because at the end of the day, fine, on paper, everything looks fantastic. Till the time you don't have a hard cash in your hand, nothing moves on. Yeah. That's one thing, and secondly, just on a quick one, uh, again, you touched a little bit of sensitive thing which was collateral. Uh, it's, it's good that you people are thinking over about it, but uh, I just wanted to check on, you may mention that for collateral, BOI is trying to work over with the credit history. You mentioned for credit history, is it restricted only to BOI or with any other bank for clearing out the loans? Just uh, as uh, a clarification. Uh, now, um, like I said, for the bank of industry, majorly you have this issue of we actually do items of plant and machinery finance for companies. So when it gets to that area, what we do is that, like normal commercial bank, we bid for forex as well with central bank. Um, presently, what we have been able to achieve thus far is that we have been able to get what we call forward rates. As I did, that is what we are getting. So when you bid, you have like, you get 30 days, 60 days of wait to be out. It's a problem, it's an issue. But what we are doing is that it is something that over time and over, we keep meeting with the to tell them, look, it's affecting businesses. Because if you give, give out a loan and they cannot assess, um, for uh, raw materials that are based on, on foreign exchange. It's actually going to be good. So it's something that we, we are actually looking at and we are working at it with uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria as regards that. Um, I think it's on, on the credit bureau, the credit bureau is run across all, all the banks. So it's not just uh, for bank of industry. It is one particular thing that we believe that over time, as we get more and more people involved in it, and we are, getting, we are getting more people having a credit history. It, it makes it a whole lot better for you to actually give loans based on actually somebody's credit history in conjunction with other things. Thank you. Thank you so much for memory on that for your use. It looks quite pretty as well. Okay, uh, lunch is um, served downstairs in the restaurant. Um, I'm hoping we can do lunch in about uh, 40 minutes. We have uh, quite a busy afternoon. I hope you enjoy lunch um, and do have lunch and uh, do please make your way back up.